say we're going to start shortly. Take your seat. The hearing will begin shortly, so I ask people to take their seats and the press to um, clear, the well. clear the well. Thank you, Dr. Uh, the committee hearing is going to begin soon, so I ask the press to please clear the well. <laughs> The Committee on Education and the Workforce will come to order. I note that a quorum is present. Without objection, the chair is authorized to call a recess at any time. Since October 7th, this committee and the nation have watched in horror as so many of our college campuses, particularly the most expensive so-called elite campuses, have erupted into hotbeds of anti-Semitism and hate. Dr. Shafiq, Mr. Schuser, Ms. Shipman, and Mr. Greenwald, you're here testifying today because Columbia University is one of the worst of those hotbeds. And we've seen far too little, far too late done to counter that and protect students and staff. Columbia stands guilty of gross negligence at best and at worst has become a platform for those supporting terrorism and violence against the Jewish people. For example, just four days after the harrowing October 7 attack, a former Columbia undergraduate beat an Israeli student with a stick while shouting racial epithets. The following day, a crowd of anti-Israel protesters marched on the university's Kraft Center for Jewish Life, causing the building to be locked down and forcing Jewish students to shelter inside. More recently, on March 24, anti-Israel groups hosted a Resistance 101 event 
in a Columbia dorm featuring speakers linked to U.S. and Israel-designated foreign terrorist organizations, including the PFLP. Speakers explicitly endorsed terrorism and called on students to support it. This unauthorized event was nevertheless promoted by Columbia faculty and staff. That a taxpayer-funded institution become a forum for the promotion of terrorism raises serious questions. Moreover, Columbia administrators have repeatedly failed in their duty to protect Jewish students from this hateful, retrograde form of discrimination. Don't take my word for it. In February, Columbia undergraduate Eden Yadiger told the committee, it is impossible to exist as a Jewish student at Columbia without running face first into anti-Semitism every single day. Jew hatred is so deeply embedded into campus culture that it has become casual and palatable among students and faculty and neglected by administrators, end quote. Let me repeat, neglected by administrators. Eden and some of her fellow Jewish classmates are in attendance today. I believe they deserve direct and clear answers about how you will address their concerns. I need not remind you that this is not just a moral duty, but a legal duty set forth in Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Finally, as the committee convenes today to conduct its solemn oversight duty of post-secondary education, I can confidently say that never has this duty been more important. The raw, visceral reaction of the nation to the unveiling of anti-Semitism at so-called elite institutions is indicative of the growing disconnect between the people and those universities. This is ev event evidenced by a general loss of public trust and faith in post-secondary education. We're headed down a dark path if we cannot agree on basic shared moral values, such as the implication of calls for genocide. Bright lines must be drawn before the reputational damage to American universities is endemic and intractable. With today's hearing, I hope to draw those bright lines. This is an opportunity for each of you to address the public directly and explain your stance on one of the great moral issues of our time. Anti-Semitism must have no safe harbor in American universities. With that, I yield to the ranking member for an opening statement. Thank you, Dr. Fox, and th thank our witnesses today for appearing with us. I'd like to start my opening statement with a video from the 2017 uh, rally to remind everyone of what, is hap what happened at the University of Virginia campus during a Unite the Right rally. Uh, as a warning, this video may contain some graphic content. Thank you. As shown in the video, white supremacist 
March Through the Grounds of the University of Virginia in 2017, chanting slogans such as, Jews will not replace us. At the time, I wrote a letter to my Republican colleagues asking for a hearing to discuss rising tensions and discrimination on college campuses. I have that letter with me today, and I'd like to ask unanimous consent yes, to enter that, record, that letter Mr. into the record. Citizens. Without objection. Regrettably, you know, the country Mr. was denied the opportunity to address this issue seven years ago. What we saw in the video is not an isolated event. It is the byproduct of this country's centrally long history of white supremacy, white supremacy and anti-Semitism. And so we should not faint surprise at hate speech on America's college campuses. The fact is that college campuses are polarized, as is our society, and we have witnessed a disturbing rise in incidents, not, not only in anti-Semitism, but also in racism, Islam, Islamophobia, homophobia, and other forms of hate. Nonetheless, schools have a responsibility to fo foster campus environments that promote understanding, respectful dialogue, and above else, si student safety for all students. Jewish students, in fact, all students, have a right to attend college free from hostility and in compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There is uh, no excuse for anti-Semitism on campus, and everyone is entitled to that safe harbor that my colleague, the chair, referred to. As Dr. Shafik notes in her testimony, quote, while there may be some easy cases, drawing a line between permissible and impermissible campus speech is enormously difficult. The U.S. Supreme Court has struggled for more than two centuries to define the limits of free speech under the First Amendment, and that struggle continues. Don't expect universities to figure it out overnight. Now, this moment requires thoughtful and nuanced discussion, something this committee has not always done. Moreover, we should expand the scope of our conversation to include the students who are actually being denied access to an education as a result of discrimination. We should not put on political theater or seize this strategy and its aftermath as an opportunity just to grandstand. Rather, we need to recenter this conversation around our obligation to provide all students with a safe learning environment. In particular, as members of Congress, we must examine the issues of anti-Semitism and all other forms of animus on campus. This includes respecting the need for safe environment to learn and the importance of the First Amendment. And finally, while I appreciate my colleagues' newfound concerns for some students' civil rights on campus, I would note that it is at odds with House Republicans' budget proposals. You can't have it both ways. You can't call for action and then reduce funding for the very agency charged with protecting students' civil rights. In conclusion, I hope this discussion today is more thoughtful and deliberate and respectful of the complex constitutional question before us, even though the same opportunity was not afforded to Democrats when we requested it after the racist UVA rally seven years ago. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scott. I appreciate the ranking member's deeply held concern about racial and other forms of discrimination. I share his abhorrence of such discrimination and white supremacist beliefs in particular. As I said in 2017, quote, the violence and bigotry displayed in Charlottesville remain an affront to our shared American values. I strongly condemn these acts of hate, end quote. It's unfortunate that referencing the tragedy in Charlottesville has become a repeated talking point at committee events intended to address the wave of anti-Semitism occurring nationwide today. The episode to which Congressman Scott refers was not organized or attended by university students. 
but was instead held by a group of white supremacists who trespassed at the university. There was no cause or jurisdiction for the committee to open a broad investigation or one into the University of Virginia for an event its students didn't attend, that the university did not approve, and that was appropriately responded to by the university. There was also no pattern of such events on campuses across the nation to address. In contrast, at Columbia and numerous other schools, there has been a pattern of unapproved anti-Semitic events organized and attended by university students and staff that have denied Jewish students their right to a safe learning environment and a failure by university administrators to respond appropriately to that denial. We will appropriately return our focus to that current crisis. First job of Pursuit. universities is to educate citizens and leaders. A university must sustain an extraordinary environment of freedom of inquiry and maintain an independence from political fashions, passions, and procedures. We will disrupt you in the streets, we will close down the bridges, we will disrupt you in restaurants, we will turn your life into a Pursuant to committee rule 8C, all members who wish to insert written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word format by 5 p.m. 14 days after the date of this hearing, which is May 1, 2024. And without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 14 days to allow such statements and other extraneous material referenced during the hearing to be submitted for the official hearing record. I now turn to the introduction of our witnesses. Our first witness is Dr. Manoush Shufik, who is the president of Columbia University in New York, New York. Our second witness is Professor David Schuzer, who is co-chair of the Task Force on Antisemitism at Columbia University in New York, New York, and served as dean of the law school from 2004 to 2014. Our next witness is Ms. Claire Shipman, who is co-chair of the Board of Trustees of Columbia University. And our final witness is Mr. David Greenwald, who's also co-chair of the Board of Trustees of Columbia University in New York. We thank you all for being here today and look forward to your testimony. I want to remind the witnesses we have read your written statements, which will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to committee rule 8D and committee practice, I ask that you each limit your oral presentation to a five-minute summary of your written statement. I also remind the witnesses to be aware of the responsibility to provide accurate information to the committee. I will first recognize Dr. Shafiq for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman Fox, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee. My name is Minu Shafiq, and I'm the 20th president of Columbia University. And let me start by saying that Columbia strives to be a community free of discrimination and hate in all its forms, and we condemn the anti-Semitism that is so pervasive today. Anti-Semitism has no place on our campus, and I am personally committed to doing everything I can to confront it directly. 
My approach to these issues is informed in part by my own experiences. I was born in Alexandria, Egypt, but after losing everything during the revolution, my family came to the United States when I was just four years old. We lived in Georgia, Florida, and North Carolina. I was the product of the desegregation era and was bused to many public schools and witnessed firsthand many aspects of discrimination. After attending the University of Massachusetts and the London School of Economics, where I later became president, I received a scholarship to attend Oxford University, where I did a doctorate in economics. For most of my career, I've worked in international organizations where people from all nationalities, religions, and backgrounds worked side by side to solve the world's problems. And I wanted to bring that 25-year track record of leading and improving large, complex, and diverse organizations to a great university like Columbia. But on October 7th, the world changed, and so did my focus. Israel was brutally attacked by Hamas terrorists, and very soon it became clear that these horrific events would ignite fear and anguish across our campus. For thousands of our Jewish and Israeli students, the catastrophe was deeply personal. Many new people that had been killed or taken hostage in the attack. For many other Columbia students, the war in Gaza also had profound personal implications and also was part of a larger story of Palestinian displacement as well as a humanitarian catastrophe. Trying to reconcile the free speech rights of those who wanted to protest and the rights of Jewish students to be in an environment free of discrimination and harassment has been the central challenge on our campus and numerous others across the country. Regrettably, the events of October 7th brought to the fore an undercurrent of anti-Semitism that is a major challenge, and like many other universities, Columbia has seen a rise in anti-Semitic incidents. We took immediate action after October 7th. We contacted those directly affected to provide them with support, both in the region and in New York. I attended a vigil for the victims on October 9th. We held daily meetings of our campus security committee. We brought in extra security expertise and had regular contact with NYPD and the FBI. I have spent most of my time since becoming president on these issues, holding over 200 meetings with groups of students, faculty, alumni, donors, parents, some of whom are here, uh, and 20 meetings with other university presidents to learn from each other. And that work has been done alongside my excellent colleagues at Columbia and with the active engagement of our trustees, including my co-chairs who are with me today. Our actions included support for students, enhanced reporting channels for incidents, hiring additional staff to investigate complaints, developing new policies on demonstrations, holding listening forums to model respectful behaviors, launching educational programs, and forming a task force of our senior academic leaders to propose solutions to anti-Semitism. From the start, I've held on to four principles. First, safety is paramount, and we would do whatever is necessary to ensure the safety of our campus. Because of those efforts, the vast majority of our demonstrations have been peaceful. Second, we would demonstrate care and compassion equally to everyone. Third, we must uphold freedom of speech because it's essential to our academic mission, but we cannot and shouldn't tolerate abuse of this privilege to harass and, disc and, and discriminate. And fourth, the ultimate answer to anti-Semitism and all its forms is education. And we should not lose sight of the powerful impact of our core mission. Will it work? There have been periods in history when anti-Semitism is in abeyance, and they were characterized by enlightened leadership, inclusive cultures, and clarity about rights and obligations. Those are the values I cherish and that I am determined to bring to Columbia. And I know together we'll emerge as a stronger community as a result. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, I now recognize Professor Schuscher um, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox, and thank you, Ranking Member Scott, for inviting me to testify today. In the wake of Hamas's barbaric atrocities on October 7th, there's been a chilling surge in anti-Semitism across the globe, and unfortunately at Columbia as well. President Shafiq asked me to serve as a co-chair of a new task force on anti-Semitism. I'm here today to share the task force's initial findings and recommendations. There's a lot to do, and we aren't yet where we need to be, but we are making real progress. Before I get into the details, 
I'll explain why the task force's work is so important to me personally. One reason is obvious, Columbia is my home. I've been on the faculty for 26 years, including 10 years as dean of the law school. I've also devoted years of my life to combating anti-Semitism, including as CEO of a Jew Jewish humanitarian organization called the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. But I also have another personal reason to ensure that Columbia provides a welcoming environment for Jews and everyone else, which is grounded in my family history. My grandfather grew up in Ukraine. His grandfather was lynched in a pogrom. A few years later, he almost met the same fate. A group of anti-Semitic thugs put my grandfather up against a wall and were about to shoot him, but he managed to get away. Thankfully, he was able to come to America. He taught himself English in the public library and eventually he enrolled at Columbia Teachers College and that changed his life. He became a Judaic studies teacher in a Hebrew school. His son became a lawyer and his son became a lawyer, and that's who's here before you today. So Columbia is not just my professional home, Columbia is my cause. I'm inspired by what the university has done for my family and for so many families from diverse backgrounds across the globe. It's critical to preserve that proud tradition. But the work of our anti-Semitism task force has not been easy. In the past six months, we've heard too many heartbreaking stories. For example, one of my students who wears a kippah was approached in the law school lobby by another student who said, F the Jews. Another was spat upon at a protest. A student wearing a shirt with an Israeli flag was pinned against a wall by a protester and told to keep effing running when he broke free. When I heard this, my first thought was of my grandfather being pushed up against a wall in Ukraine. This is simply unacceptable. It's also heartbreaking that many Jewish and Israeli students feel uncomfortable in student groups having nothing to do with the Middle East. Being a Zionist should not disqualify anyone from a dance group or a theater production. This sort of pressure, signaling that Jews are accepted only if they reject a core part of their religion and identity, well, it sounds like old-fashioned bigotry to me, and again, this is simply unacceptable. Although there are problems at Columbia, many capable and dedicated people are working hard to address them. Our task force has been in close touch with President Shafiq, her leadership team, the board, as well as faculty, staff, students, graduates, and parents from across the university. Our task force began with a report last month on the rules governing protests. We offered four main recommendations and the university is implementing all of them. First, protests should be allowed only in designated locations, not in academic buildings. Protected speech is essential, but it can't get in the way of other people's rights to speak. Second, the university needs to be more effective in enforcing its rules, so we suggested improvements. Third, a few years ago, the university launched a major initiative to combat gender-based misconduct. We need a comparable effort for anti-Semitism. And fourth, the university needs to avoid double standards. When Jewish students complain that speech makes them uncomfortable, they should get the same treatment as other groups. We plan to issue another report in May drawing on over 20 listening sessions with students to describe student encounters with anti-Semitism, discuss definitions of anti-Semitism, and recommend changes in orientation, student services, and student groups. We will issue more reports next year as well. In all of this work, we are mindful of a university's solemn responsibility to teach the next generation. So they think critically, seek knowledge, cherish and defend liberty, and build a better world. We may disagree, even passionately, but we are at our best when we state our positions with civility. This shows not only skill as an advocate, but also human decency, respect for shared values, and respect for each other. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Ms. Schumann, you're recognized for five minutes. Chairwoman Fox, Ranking Member Scott, members of the committee, Thank you for the opportunity to be here today and to discuss Columbia's efforts to combat anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism is dangerous and reprehensible. It has no place at Columbia or in our society. And I'm grateful as a citizen and as co-chair of our board for the spotlight you're putting on this ancient hatred and the critical role you all play in holding our most important institutions accountable. As a reporter, I always have a bias toward transparency and accountability. It is difficult and heartbreaking to hear 
as we do regularly, that members of our community, like these brave students who are here today, feel unsafe. I am the parent of college-age children. I know dozens of students at Columbia, and I feel this current climate on our campus viscerally. It is unacceptable. I can tell you plainly that I am not satisfied with where Columbia is at the moment. As co-chair of the board, I bear responsibility for that. This role is one of the great privileges of my life, and I take the weight of its responsibility seriously. I am dedicated to addressing these concerns. The days immediately following October 7th are the most painful I've experienced on our campus. I knew as word of the horrific Hamas terror attack started to spread that this terrorist tragedy would have a devastating impact, especially on our Jewish students. Two days later, President Shafiq and I joined hundreds of members of our community for a somber candlelight, candlelight vigil on the steps of Lowe Library. The grief was intense. It was a moment of comfort, but that moment would be fleeting. The last six months on our campus have served as an extreme pressure test. Our systems clearly have not been equipped to manage the unfolding situation. But with each challenge, we have moved to adapt. Physical safety, as President Shafiq, Shafiq said, was and is paramount. We were seeing protests of an unprecedented type and scale, levels of threats and harassment, especially directed at our Jewish students, that was unacceptable. We shut our gates, we backed the critical decision to bring the New York City Police Department onto our campus during demonstrations for the first time in 50 years. We've also brought on other law enforcement experts, rewritten our rules, beefed up our enforcement process. We've suspended two student groups for noncompliance, more than a dozen individual students, and we discipline faculty members. We've also created a heavily respected independent anti-Semitism task force, as you've heard, and launched training across the university on anti-Semitism. I hope to be able to talk about more of our efforts later, but let me say something equally important. We are far from done. I am outraged by the vile sentiments I continue to hear by those who ignore our rules, and we are holding them accountable. This problem, though, goes deeper than discipline. It's about returning to our core values as an institution. Late last fall, I moderated a powerful event with two brilliant women, our Israeli dean of our foreign policy school and her friend, the Palestinian dean of Princeton's foreign policy school. They didn't agree on everything, but the women spoke with empathy, wisdom, common sense, and respect. That should be our steady state. 40 years ago, I arrived in New York from Columbus, Ohio, a financial aid student with little sense about the school, about the city, or even the world. I was challenged by the breadth of ideas and outlooks. I drank up the chance to rub shoulders with cutting edge DNA researchers, frontline Cold War strategists who changed my political point of view. Columbia changed my life. That is what universities are meant to do, to teach students how to think, not what to think, to challenge and broaden, and definitely not to intimidate and terrorize. We can be a campus that battles both anti-Semitism and all bigotry, and also be a place that allows for vigorous debate, a place that can weigh the most difficult questions in the world in a civilized, respectful fashion. We are determined to create again a flourishing ecosystem, but a healthy Columbia as we rebuild must start with common sense and common decency with respect for each other and our rules. We all here are committed to being honest about where we are and doing the hard work, and I can tell you we will not stop until we get it right. I look forward today to getting your input. Thank you. Thank you. I now recognize Mr. Greenwald for five minutes. Chairwoman Fox, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss how Columbia University is fighting the surge in anti-Semitism on our campuses since the revolting and horrific Hamas terrorist attack on October 7th. We recognize this hearing as part of a broader effort by the committee to combat anti-Semitism and bigotry on college campuses. We stand ready to assist the committee. In recent years, anti-Semitism has been on the rise across the world throughout the United States and on university campuses. This disturbing 
trend was starkly brought to the forefront on October 7th. We agree with the committee, it's essential that we take on this fight. Let me make clear from the outset, any targeting of Jews for hate, harassment, violence, intimidation, discrimination, or exclusion is anti-Semitic and unacceptable at Columbia. The university's leadership, including the Board of Trustees and President Shafiq, are committed to stopping these incidents and standing with the Jewish community. We know this work is not complete. I've been co-chair of the Board of Trustees Mr. together Greenwald, with Claire. We've, would you, we've been asked to have you pull your mic closer to you, please. Thank you. Okay. Is that better? Okay, thank you. Uh, for 40 years since graduating from Columbia Law School, I practiced in New York and London until retiring as chairman of the Freed Frank firm in February of this year. My wife Beth is in the audience today demonstrating the love and support she has shown me for 40 years. I'm a Jewish American. I've been subjected to anti-Semitism. Beth and I are active in the Jewish community and in 2017, I proudly accepted the American Jewish Committee's <coughs> Learned Hand Award. The AJC works to combat anti-Semitism in bigotry in all forms. I mention my background only to make clear that I come to these issues with personal experience. There was corrosive and unacceptable fear at Columbia following the barbaric terrorist attacks by Hamas on Israeli citizens, women, children, and babies. A professor glorified the attacks. A group of faculty penned a letter saying that the terrorist attacks were legitimate military actions. There were protests on campus in which protesters shouted from the river to the sea and held banners saying things like, whatever it takes. Many Jews hear and see that as a call to eliminate Israel and Jews everywhere. As a result, many Jewish students and other members of our Columbia community did not feel safe. By their very nature, universities are places for lively debate and disagreement, but those debates must be respectful, peaceful, and collegial. When those debates devolve into anti-Semitic harassment, discrimination, or violence, as has unacceptably happened at Columbia after October 7th, there must be consequences. Since October 7th, the Board of Trustees and the university, including the four member, members of, the, of this panel, have taken many steps to combat anti-Semitism on our campuses and to ensure the safety of the Columbia community. I set out in detail some of these steps in my written testimony. I'll mention only a few here. At the trustee level, we quickly formed our own task force with a view toward overseeing the actions of our leadership and developing ideas for addressing anti-Semitism. Two student groups have been suspended. We engaged the FBI in response to a vile and shocking unauthorized event that took place in a university residence last month. Ten students were suspended from the university in connection with that despicable event. Consistent with principles of free speech, Protests on campus have been restricted to locations consistent with our commitment to a safe and inclusive community. Action has been taken against multiple faculty members and numerous additional faculty members are under investigation. Columbia has implemented at least 90 disciplinary measures against students. If necessary, additional actions of this nature will be taken to combat anti-Semitism and to promote the safety of the members of our community. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss a topic of critical importance to me, to Columbia, and more broadly to our nation. Eliminating anti-Semitism takes unrelenting and aggressive effort. Columbia is committed to making those efforts to address this ancient scourge. I welcome your questions and advice. Thank you very much. Under committee rule nine, we will now question witnesses under the five minute rule I remind members that I'll enforce the five minute rule strictly so you're advised to keep your questions succinct so the witnesses have time to answer. I will begin the questioning. Dr. Shafiq, you described the April 4, quote, all out for Al Shifa, end quote, event that took place at Columbia's campus as a, quote, unapproved event near academic buildings in violation of our rules and policies, end quote. You promised that participants would, quote, face discipline, end quote. 
your university policy requires disciplinary action to be initiated shortly after an incident occurs. According to records provided by Columbia to the committee, the school identified at least 32 participants at the event and sent out, quote, interim warning letters to them, quote, to remind you of Columbia's policies, end quote. Is that what you meant by facing discipline? Chairwoman, I want to confirm that yes, we did, we did send warning letters. We developed, uh, in consultation with our anti-Semitism task force, uh, a new demonstration policy which clarified what would happen to students who attended unsanctioned events. And that policy along that we also worked with our faculty and students on has a hierarchy of punishments. Anyone who attends an unsanctioned event is immediately sent a warning letter and if it's uh, as, as, as an immediate action. If other sorts of misconduct occur at such an event, uh, there could be further sanctions. Okay, let me follow up on that then. If sending warning letters is discipline, has Columbia sent out warning letters following the dozens of other unapproved events that have occurred since October 7th? Since we've had this new policy in place, since we've had this new policy in place, yes, I would confirm that we have sent, and those letters are sent out immediately. Those letters, uh, if there have been repeat offenses, stay permanently on the record of those students for the rest of their time at Columbia. And of course, if other, if other misconduct occurs, it can lead to suspension and, in extreme cases, expulsion. Well, how can we be confident that you'll restore order in a safe learning environment if it took you months to send warning letters? The, Chairwoman, I want to reassure you, I have absolutely no hesitation in enforcing our policies. When I first started at Columbia, our policies, our systems, and our enforcement mechanisms were not up to the scale of this challenge. Okay. They were they were designed for a very different world. They were designed for a student cheating on well, an let's, exam. Well, let's go to the April 4th when you did have policies in effect. Right. So the day before the April 4th rally, a Columbia University Apartheid Divest Substack post warned participants to wear masks, cover any identifying features, and not swipe their Columbia IDs to evade accountability for disciplinary violations. What discipline has Columbia imposed to address the group's leaders instructing students how to break the rules because you, you can tell by their being on the substack who they are? Mm. I think one of the most effective things that we have done since uh, the start, since October 7th, is that when we know that events will happen, we have moved toward requiring Columbia University IDs to access our campus. That has prevented outside forces to come and cause trouble. And I think that's a very important reason why most of our demonstrations, in fact, the vast majority, have been safe. And but we did one so of those on that students, occasion. one of those organizers and speaker at this unapproved pro Hamas rally was a student already suspended for hosting an affiliate of a terrorist organization. Do you agree that this continued defiance further aggravates the severity of the violations by the suspended students, as well as the group organizing the event? Because the, the students don't seem to be afraid of your letters. Chairwoman, I, I assure you, the students are not getting letters, as has previously been said. We have already suspended 15 students from Columbia. We have six on disciplinary probation. These are more disciplinary actions that have been taken probably in the last decade at Columbia. And I promise you from the messages I'm hearing from students, they are, um, they are getting the message that violations well, of our policies you. will have consequences. Thank you. Mr. Greenwald, the trustees at Columbia are ultimately responsible for Columbia's governance. All of us have seen the true nature of the environment at Columbia Exposed. Can you honestly say that you and the board fulfill the trust placed in you to maintain the good character of Columbia when you see the repeated screams of hate on your campus? The anti-Semitism on our campus makes me sick to my stomach. And we are taking steps to address it. 
Thank you. I now recognize Ms. Bonamici for five minutes. Thank you so much to the witnesses for being here today. I condemn in the strongest possible terms anti-Semitism on college campuses or anywhere. And it is my sincere hope that this committee will work together on real and tangible solutions to address it. We should be hearing from experts who can help the committee determine what the response should be to an increase in anti-Semitism, as well as Islamophobia, racial hostility, and other forms of discrimination and hate speech, and whether there are sufficient resources and tools under Title VI of the Civil Rights Act to keep up with this increase. And it is also my hope that many of you to exploit this real and very concerning challenge to further political goals or narratives. So to begin, I would like to clarify something with a simple yes or no question for all of the witnesses. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Columbia's code of conduct? Mr. Greenwald. Yes, it does. Ms. Shipman. Yes, it does. Dr. Shafiq. Yes, it does. And Professor Schizer. Yes, it does. Thank you. And my next question is to Dr. Shafiq, and then I'll have a question for Professor Schizer. Dr. Shafiq, as president of Columbia, what is it like when you hear chants like, by any means necessary, or intifada revolution? And do these chants violate Columbia's rules? I find those chants incredibly distressing, and I wish profoundly that people would not use them on our campus. I, I wish that even more after the many, many conversations that I've had with our Jewish students when they tell me how they feel when they hear those words. They find it threatening, they find it frightening, and uh, it's abhorrent and, has, uh, and it has no place in our community. I think one of the issues that we are actively debating now and which David Schizer, I hope, as part of the anti-Semitism task force will help us find solutions, as you've asked for, Congresswoman, is to actually clarify where language crosses the line from protected speech to discriminatory or harassing speech. Our, we've already sent a message to our community when all 17 deans of Columbia University, in a historic message which has never been done before, said that we need to be sensitive about language and some of those expressions that you have said, river to the sea, intifada, are, uh, are incredibly hurtful. And we need to be, as a community, be aware that that language is hurtful. So we've already sent a strong signal. I think one of the excellent recommendations of our anti-Semitism task force is that they have said that if you are going to chant, it should only be in a certain place, so people who don't want to hear it are protected from having to hear it. Thank and you. I, I, want to f I do want time to follow up with Professor Schizer. Thank you. Uh, Professor Schizer, my husband's grandfather also survived pogroms, so it means a lot to my family as well. Um, you heard Dr. Shafiq's answer. We know that you are one of the co-leaders of Dr. Shafiq's anti-Semitism task force, as well as the former law school dean. So will you please explain the First Amendment considerations behind Columbia's current policies? So the chants we are hearing, some of them are absolutely repugnant and offensive, and let's be honest about that. As we approach what to do, we have to remember three principles, and the first is free speech matters, protected speech, we don't want to suppress points of view. And the second point is we don't just have free speech, we have free speech responsibilities. The fact that I can speak, doesn't mean, Congresswoman, that I could shout you down or prevent your students from hearing you. And third, free speech doesn't extend to harassment and discrimination. And so what we need to do is we need to make sure that our students are protected from harassment and discrimination, even as we protect speech. And on your work on the task force, are you convinced that that work will address that need? These are very difficult issues, but I am convinced that we are working closely with the university and we will get the job done. Thank you, and I will yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Mr. Wilson, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I'd like to thank each of you for being here. Uh, the name Columbia is very important to me. I represent Columbia, <coughs> South Carolina, uh, with uh, Mayor uh, Dan Rickerman, okay? I'm very grateful that my uh, wife, Roxanne, uh, is a graduate of Columbia College in Columbia, South Carolina. And so, uh, so please keep the name positive. Uh, aside from that, uh, I'm also uh, very grateful that I grew up in the holy city of Charleston, South Carolina. 
And so I grew up with an appreciation of the people of Jewish heritage. Uh, at the time of the American Revolution, the largest Jewish population in the New World was in Charleston, South Carolina. The first provincial constitution to recognize Judaism as religion was South Carolina. The first Jewish American elected official in the New World was in the provincial assembly. Sadly, the first Jewish American killed in the revolution was in Charleston, South Carolina. That's the in environment I grew up in, and that's why I just can't believe the environment we're in today. And, I, I'm, uh, and it's just got to be addressed. Uh, and the barbaric mass murder of October 7th by Iranian puppets of Hamas invading Israel has shockingly revealed that many college campuses are sickeningly anti-Semitic and time and time again are defending the maniacal Hamas agenda. The agenda needs to be known. They've published it, uh, and it's the Hamas Covenant of August 18, 1988. And it, in Article 7, makes clear to chase every Jew behind a rock and tree until you find the last Jew and kill him behind the rock. Uh, and so this is not an accident. And additionally, we need to identify, too, that uh, Hamas is a puppet of Iran, as is Hezbollah, who on January 28th killed three young American uh, army reservists. And so this should not be forgotten, uh, the type of people we're dealing with. College campuses have descended from the coveted citadels of intellectual freedom to illiberal arenas of intolerance and bigotry, full of closed-minded intolerance that is protected by left-wing academia. All Americans in good faith want college education to be meaningful students to achieve the American dream, free from harassment, intimidation, and uh, destructive and mindless indoctrination. And I uh, particularly support uh, diversity of intellectual uh, ideology, uh, ideology. It should be, when we talk about diversity, good gosh, it should be uh, ideological too, not um, uh, mandated uh, uh, Soviet-style uh, education. And so I wrote a column uh, for the Washington Times op-ed December 7th last year explaining my concern about anti-Semitism. And President Shafiq, there are dozens of anti-Semitic incidents documented in the committee's February 12th document request letter, legal complaints by students and student videos. Sadly, the documents Columbia produced to the committee show the university only suspended three students for anti-Semitic incidents between October 7th and March 24th with the Resistance 101 uh, event. All three of those were lifted or reduced upon adjudication. What standard does Columbia use to decide the anti-Semitic conduct relies, rises to the level of what you've identified as suppression? Thank you very much. And I wanted to say I share your deep concern about anti-Semitism and your concern about diversity of thought, which is something that's very important to me in my role as president of Columbia. I think the fundamental issue, and I think this is something the Anti-Defamation League has said in its own work, the ultimate solution to fighting this horrible form of bigotry is education. And that is a huge focus for us at Columbia. We're changing the way we do orientation for our incoming students to make sure that they're educated about anti-Semitism. And we're also looking at expanding our academic office offer. We already have about 50 courses at Columbia on Israel, on Jewish studies, on the Middle East. And we need to expand that in order to ultimately deal with this horrible problem. Well, we would support every effort. And then, hey, I, I want to express concern, too, and, I'm, and that is uh, the uh, Columbia School of Social Work uh, has a glossary uh, which identifies capitalism as a system of economic oppression. I hope uh, that your academics visit Pyongyang. I'm one uh, with uh, former Congressman uh, Elliot Engel. I've been to Pyongyang. I've seen the benefits of socialism and communism. Uh, they have reduced uh, what was the wealthiest part of Korea into the poorest with a per capita income of $867. South Korea, capitalist South Korea, $44,000. The thought of saying that capitalism is oppressive uh, is so insulting and, uh, and stupid and, and historically incorrect. And uh, uh, communism, socialism, fascism do not work. Capitalism does. That's why America is the most successful country on earth. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Takano, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I strongly condemn uh, anti-Semitic behavior, anti-Semitic uh, 
speech, anti-Semitic actions on any college campus, and likewise, I condemn uh, anti-Palestinian or anti-Islamic or Islamophobic behavior as well. Um, uh, you know, uh, Professor Schizer, um I'm struck by uh, some work, survey research done by Richard Pape uh, with the University of Chicago's project on security threats, security and threats um, of higher education on the extent of campus fears and changes in anti-Semitism after October 7th. While his findings reveal that 56% of Jewish students felt in personal danger, 52% of Muslim college students feel also in personal danger. Most surprisingly, 16% of other college students felt in personal danger as a result of the campus, uh, current campuses, climate on campuses. He further concludes that, quote, different perceptions of intent are likely contributing to those fears. 66% of Jewish students understand the pro-Palestinian protest chant, quote, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, unquote, to mean the expulsion and genocide of Israeli Jews, while only 14% of Muslims understand the chant that way. Dr. Pate believes the underlying fears that are not being addressed are fueling both anti-Semitic and anti-Islamic sentiment on campus. Quote, about 10% of college students would permit student groups to call for genocide against Jews, and about 13% of college students say that when Jews are attacked, it is because they deserve it. When these same questions are asked about Muslims, we find the same percentages, 10% and 13% respectively. In particular, the findings are an opportunity to recenter the national discussion around students and away from politics. The findings show strong support for calming actions such as major public statements by university and national leaders that would condemn violence of any kind against any group of people. What is your reaction to uh, you know, Professor Pape's uh, research and what you've been doing with your, with your group? I think your question and his research highlight the importance of this hearing, and I'm grateful to all of you for holding it. It is unacceptable for any students at any university to feel fear or to feel uncomfortable because of who they are. We can't have that in the United States of America. And so uh, if you ask me, are we doing enough? I say we haven't yet done enough and we are on our way, but we have a way to go. Um, I will just emphasize two other things. First of all, we need consistency, right? What we do for Jewish students, what we do for Muslim students, we need to do for all students. Consistency is at its core what our country is about. And I think sometimes we've fallen short there. But we need to focus on that and we need to protect everyone while also allowing robust debate because that is the essence of a university. So, uh, Professor Schizer, in your task force work to combat anti-Semitism, I, 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 I believe you're also focused on, with, the, with your statement about consistency, um, you know, making sure that all students are safe, your Muslim students, your Palestinian students are safe. Is, is that true? Is that, is that accurate? Absolutely, and I should say our specific mandate is anti-Semitism, but we hope that our recommendations and the ideas we develop with colleagues will be applicable to everyone and will be helpful to everyone. Well, you know, I'm struck by your comments, uh, your written comments, when you say uh, members of a group that say, that, are particular, that say particular phrases or comments uh, that interfere with their ability to learn and work, uh, uh, should the university defer to them? In recent years, this sort of deference has been commonplace, for, example, for instance, when women, uh, black and transgender students have registered concerns in discussions of sexual assault, policing, and transgender rights. But the response has been different when Jewish students and Israeli students lodged some similar complaints after October 7th. With the time remaining, can you kind of help unpack that a bit more for the committee? Sure. I'm a conservative. I'm close to many conservative students. There have been times when they've gotten the signal that they should really go slow on a particular event or not articulate a particular position because it makes others feel uncomfortable. And it is striking how that kind of language has not been applied to Jewish students. When Jewish students have said, we feel uncomfortable, the emphasis has been, no, 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 free speech. Now, I want to be clear. I think free speech is essential, but I also think consistency is essential. We need to have the same approach for everyone. Thank you, my time is up. I wish I could talk to you more, um, but uh, I yield back, Madam Chair.
Thank you, Mr. Ticano. Mr. Wahlberg, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the panel for being here. Uh, the day after the October 7th attack, Professor <laughs> Joseph Massad, and I only single him out amongst numerous others that I could single out, uh, because he particularly is a tenured professor and chairs the School of Arts and Sciences Academic Review Committee. He wrote in an article praising, and I quote him, the innovative Palestinian resistance, end quote, for attacking Israel and glorifying Hamas's slaughter of nearly 1,200 Jews as, and I quote again, awesome, astonishing, astounding, and incredible. What perverse statements. A tenured professor who's been saying these type of things for 20 years at Columbia. Professor, Professor, uh, President Shafiq, you recently said, and I quote, it is absolutely unacceptable for any member of the Columbia community to promote the use of terror and violence, end quote. Do you condemn Professor Massad's statement and has he faced any consequences for it? Congressman, I do condemn his statement. I am appalled by what he said. Any consequences? He has been spoken to. Uh, spoken and to? I should just, and I think you could. So support, to support of terrorism is acceptable if you're a Columbia professor? Not at all. And I should say. He's been spoken to? I, I, I didn't get to. I, I, I have just, your answer. No. <laughs> uh, let, me, let, me, let me move on here. Professor Massad mm. has also been known to have called Israelis, quote, cruel and bloodthirsty colonizers, end quote, and foreigners who joined the Israeli military as, quote, baby-killing Zionist Jew Jewish volunteers for Israeli Jewish supremacy, end quote. In 2005, an investigation by Columbia corroborated allegations that Mossad yelled at Ju a Jewish student who questioned his views to, quote, get out of my classroom. Can you imagine free speech? Diversity on campus. Well, let, let's move it over. Let's, let's, let's intentionally disregard the feelings of a Jewish student as being less than human in this classroom to someone like myself who might be given this to wear to remember and bring home the hostages now to quietly take it off so my professor wouldn't see it, a professor who holds my academic career in the palm of his hands. That's free speech. That's diversity. President Shafiq, I'm concerned that that isn't happening here. So let me ask this question. As the chair of the School of Arts and Sciences Academic Review Committee, Professor Massad is responsible for, quote, overseeing the periodic review of all departments, centers, and institutes in, in the school. Do you stand behind Professor Massad, remaining chair of the Academic Review Committee, giving his support for terrorism and harassing Jewish students? Congressman Walbrook, I just want to confirm that when faculty behave in any discriminatory fashion at Columbia, you talk to them. There are consequences. No, we take them out of the classroom if necessary. We Is he out of the classroom? We leadership posts if necessary. We allow students to leave those classes if they feel at all uncomfortable. Is he out and of the classroom? He, he is, he is I, I believe to answer your question, he is no longer chair of that committee and ha does not have a leadership role. But not out of the classroom. Let me, let me, let me move over to, over to the uh, trustees. Um, as trustees, would you approve Professor Massad for tenure if the decision were before you today? I would not. Nor would I. Then why is he still in the classroom? You are trustees of this preeminent institution of diversity, of free thought. And you talk to professors who make horrific statements like this. And I, as I said, I could have addressed other professors. You, in fact, even pointed out that there were numerous, numerous professors that you're looking at right now. If they're only going to get a talking to, 
I'm concerned. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Wahlberg. Dr. Adams, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank, thank the witnesses for being here today. Uh, many of us here uh, never would have imagined that we would be concerned about the safety of Jewish Americans in, in New York, of, of all places. Uh, Jewish Americans have faced some of the highest levels of anti-Semitic anti incidents since the FBI began monitoring. Anti-Semitic incidents at, at U U.S. college campuses have increased in both number and intensity since October 7th. And as a former professor myself of 40 years, I'll tell you on a campus, that is unacceptable. 73% um, of Jewish college students have experienced or witnessed uh, some form of anti-Semitism since the beginning of the school year, and only one-third of Jewish students felt safe on campuses. I think every student should feel safe on any campus uh, that they're studying on. But um, Mr. Scheiser, let me ask you, you are co-chair of the Task Force on Anti-Semitism on your campus. Uh, how has the task force recognized the unique challenges that Columbia faces in dealing with protests and demonstrations, harassment allegations, and overall threats to segments of the student population while being an urban and open campus in one of the largest cities in the world? It's a critical responsibility, Congresswoman, for exactly the reasons that you described. This is not an acceptable situation. I do want to say there are wonderful things happening at Columbia, too, and part of what moves me is how many people have pitched in to make sure that we deal with this problem. But the problem is there, and it is not yet fixed. And I will say that our first step was to look at rules for protests, and I am very grateful that our responses have been taken so seriously. And as I said, the university is implementing all of our recommendations, but we're only just getting started. We have another report coming out next month. We've got to look at student orientations. We've got to look at the way we train people who deal with students. We've got to look at the policies for student groups to make sure that people don't get excluded. And then we have more reports that we have in mind for next year, including careful research to get detailed insights into the people who've been victims of this discrimination, because we need to understand it and we need to stop it. Thank you, sir. So you're expecting uh, recommendations uh, from this? Okay. So uh, Columbia is over 270 years old. That's almost uh, three decades, or, or three centuries, actually. Uh, and it, it wasn't until 1873 that Columbia became an integrated institution by allowing its first black student uh, by the name of James R. Priest to enroll, who was also the son of a former slave. Over history, your missions and role have evolved as an institution of higher education. And my question uh, to, uh, to you is, uh, how do the trustees work to ensure that Columbia remains true to its practice of progress while making sure that it is welcoming and responsive to demographic groups that it was not originally designed to serve? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So. One of the great privileges of being at a university is a diverse student body. People who come from very different backgrounds who then meet each other, learn from each other, learn with each other. And we need to be sure that that continues to happen uh, in all the ways that universities do well. And one of the challenges of the recent months is that I think we've fallen short in various ways. But the aspiration is there. And our commitment to be welcoming and also open has to apply to everyone. Thank you. So Ms. Uh, Ms. Shipman or Mr. Greenwald, would you like to respond? Got 57 seconds. I agree with Professor Schizer, uh bringing diverse people to campus with coming from different backgrounds, different places in the country, different places from around the world is enriching to their educational experience. OK, Ms. Shipman. I agree with that. Congresswoman, I would also say um, that fundamentally our institution has got to be about respect and that is sorely lacking on our campus right now and we can have diversity and different points of view but if people are not listening and they're weaponizing their sentiments, nobody's learning. Yes, ma'am. Well, certainly the goal should be to ensure that every member of a campus community can reach their full potential without additional burdens of 
stereotypes and biases and systemic barriers. And uh, I hope that um, Columbia can take, uh, and our universities can, can take some steps to support students on the ground. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I'm going to yield back. I only have about six seconds. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Ms. Stefanik. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman. I want to follow up on my colleague Rep. Wahlberg's question regarding Professor Joseph Massad. So let me be clear, uh, President, that he was spoken to. Who spoke with him? Uh, he was spoken to by his head of department and his dean. And what was what was he told? I was not in those conversations. I think. But you're not aware that, what he was that told? language what was, was unacceptable. He told? What was that, he told? That that language was unacceptable. And were there any other enforcement actions taken? Any other disciplinary actions taken? In his case, he has not repeated anything like that ever since. Does he I need to repeat stating that the massacre of Israeli civilians was awesome? Does he need to repeat his participation in an unauthorized pro-Hamas demonstration on April 4th? Mm -hmm. You know, Professor David Scheiser talked about, Schizer talked about the lack of enforcement do you agree that this is an issue with a lack of enforcement when the policy of Columbia specifically stated on, on April 7th, April 5th said, I want to make clear that it is absolutely unacceptable for any member of this community to promote the use of terror or violence, mm -hmm. and yet you have no action, no disciplinary action. Do you agree with how the university has handled this? Yeah, we have uh, 4,700 faculty at Columbia most of whom spend all of their time dedicated to teaching their students. But I'm talking about the faculty members yeah. who are supporting terror. And it's not just that case. Let me bring your attention to Muhammad Abdu, who was hired after the October 7th terrorist attack against Israel. He, on October 11th, posted, yes, I'm with Hamas and Hezbollah and Islamic Jihad. He also decried false reports accusing Arabs and Muslims of decapitating the, head, decapitating the heads of children and being rapists. We know that there were decapitations of babies, of innocent Israeli citizens, of seniors, of women, there were rapes, and yet Columbia hired this individual as a professor. How did that hiring process work? Were you aware of those statements before the hiring? I share with you your repugnance at those remarks, I completely understand that. On my watch, faculty who make remarks that cross the line in terms of anti-Semitism, there will be consequences for them. What are I the consequences five, I have in this case? I have five cases at the moment who have either been dis either taken out of the classroom or dismissed. And is he one of those? He will, he will never work at Columbia again. So he has been terminated? He has, he has been terminated, he has, and not just terminated, but his files will show that he will never work at Columbia again. So he's currently not employed by Columbia? He is grading his students' papers and will never teach at Columbia again, and that will be on his permanent How record. are you changing the hiring processes? Because on your watch, he was hired after he made these statements publicly. How are you ensuring this does not happen with your hiring process moving forward? So when we hire people, uh, obviously they have to meet the academic qualifications, but we do an employment check and a criminal record check. We also ask everyone to do an attestation that they have never been accused of discrimination or part of an investigation around harassment or discrimination. And that attestation has to be signed by all new employees. And it didn't work in this case? I think in this case, well, he may not have been. Uh, uh, subject to an investigation on discrimination or found guilty. It has to be you found guilty. But don't you it think it's a problem qualified. when the hiring process of Columbia is hiring someone who makes those statements and I they hire him you. after making those statements? I agree with you that I think we need to look at how to toughen up those requirements. We do have a requirement, but I agree with you. I think we need to look at how we can make Let them Let me ask effective. about Professor Catherine Frank from the Columbia Law School, who said that all Israeli students who have served in the IDF are dangerous and shouldn't be on campus. What disciplinary action has been taken against that professor? I agree with you that those comments are completely unacceptable and discriminatory. But I'm asking and you what disciplinary action has been taken. She, she has been to spoken to by a very senior person in the administration, and she has said that that was not what she intended to say. And has she publicly apologized? I have suggested that. You have suggested that? Has no, she done that? I think, I, I, think, I think 
she will be finding a way to clarify her position. You see the concern here, though, with the lack of enforcement. You see the concern that speaking to these professors is not enough, and it's sending a message across the university that this is tolerated, these anti-Semitic statements from a position of, a, of authority in professors in the classroom is tolerated. My time has expired, but I will have multiple rounds of questions. I yield back. Ms. Manning, you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair. Professor Shafiq, I understand that all Columbia students go through an orientation that includes anti-discrimination training. Does that training include comprehensive education about anti-Semitism, including the central role Israel plays in Judaism? Thank you for that question. Up in, in the past, that was not the case. And that is something we are actively working but on. But is We've that been, taking place right now? We have uh, trained our student affairs uh, staff across Columbia. But I, we think are, I think time is of the essence, and I hope you will commit to getting that training in place immediately. Yes, it is, it is being put in place now for our incoming class. Okay, the, the report issued by your task force on anti-Semitism says that discrimination and harassment are not protected speech. We have seen chants at Columbia calling to globalize the Intifada, and much worse. During the Intifada, Palestinian suicide bombers blew up Israelis on city buses, at restaurants, even at weddings. And in fact, Columbia alum Sarah Duker was killed in a bus bombing in Jerusalem in 1996. Given this history, are calls to globalize the Intifada acceptable at Columbia? So I Just a yes or no answer, please. I personally find it unacceptable. Our current rules uh, have not specified that as not acceptable, but we have sent a very clear message to our community that that kind of language is unacceptable. I certainly and we hope are you will rectify working. that in your statements. The, we, the task force report also states uh, that anti-Semitism includes efforts to rationalize or endorse the murder of Jews or the destruction of the state of Israel. And I'd like to submit for the record an article written by Professor Joseph Massad uh, that rationalizes the murder of Jews and the destruction of the state of Israel. Why is that professor still teaching at Columbia? As I said, we have mechanisms in place where faculty cross the line. We have done we have many cases, and when we have any complaints from students saying they feel uncomfortable, is he still there are teaching? disciplinary processes Is he in still place. teaching? Uh, he is still on the faculty. Is he still teaching? I'm not, I, I, I'm not, I don't want to misspeak. I'm not sure he's teaching okay. at the moment. The task force report also states that the mission of a great university requires uncompromising rigor in uncovering facts and analyzing ideas. Now, the article that I just asked to be submitted to the record demonstrates that this professor has an extreme one-sided view of the long-standing conflict in the Middle East, which views Israel as illegitimate and any attempt to destroy Israelis as legitimate. Is teaching this one-sided view of the conflict in the Middle East in line with your mission to educate your students with uncompromising rigor in uncovering facts and analyzing ideas? Our objective is to give students a broad exposure to many ideas. We have about 50 courses at the moment which cover Israeli and Jewish studies, the Middle East, and it's important but that no they be exposed to all of those But no one student can take all 50 views. courses. Is, is there an effort to make sure that both sides, of course, I don't agree that the, the murder of Jews and the destruction of Israel is a side that should be taught, but are there, for example, any professors in your Middle East Studies Department who, believes that, who believe that Israel has the right to exist as a Jewish state? In fact, the head of that department is an Israeli. And that, that doesn't answer my question. <laughs> no. And we have many faculty at Columbia who clearly would take that view. I should also say that most of these courses are electives and students can choose which professors they want to study with. But I would, you know, obviously we want them to have a broader range of views. So I am worried about how we get at the underlying issue 
that there is such anti-Semitism on your college campus. Now, step one is to make sure that there is rigorous anti-Semitism training in your uh, anti-discrimination course that all your students are supposed to take. Step two is having that same training for your faculty members. Yes. And step three is making sure that your Middle East Studies Department does not foment anti-Semitism by teaching that Israel is illegitimate as a student, as a, as a state, and that Jews should be murdered to get rid of Israel. Is that a problem? Congresswoman, I agree with you. We are in active discussions with Ted Deutsch of the American Jewish Congress uh, on the kinds of educational programs that they have developed, and we are looking at how we can integrate them. We've done some of that already with our student affairs staff, and we are working with the anti-Semitism I believe you have a core curriculum at, anti at, at Columbia. I suggest you insert that, and I'd like to close by asking that a statement by my colleague, uh, Representative Richie Torres, also be entered into the record. With that, my time has expired, and I yield back. Without objection, the uh, material the gentleman asked to be in, put in the record will be placed in the record. Mr. Grossman, you're recognized for five minutes. I'll, I'll yield to I'll y yield to Representative Stefanik for a question. Just to follow up, you should know this, President Shafiq, but Mossad is still, in fact, listed on the Columbia website as chair of the Academic Review Committee. Are you aware of that? I would need to check that. I don't it's, want to it's the website's right here. I don't here. want to misstate because I, so I don't, he hasn't I don't been know removed if it's as chair. I, I, I would like to. Do you have my that commitment? He'll be removed as chair today. I have my commitment. I, commitment that I will come back to you and give you the facts. So first. he hasn't been removed. So you said in front of Congress under oath no, no, that I, said I, I'm, I am not sure he I was need to removed. Check. Well, I'll tell you what. He's still listed on chair. Let me ask the board of trustees: Is that acceptable that he's chair of this committee? Should he be removed today, Ms. Shipman? Congresswoman, uh, you've put your finger on one of the hardest issues we, as board chairs, face right now. I think you can see. Our systems, from the videos you played, everything you're talking about, our systems of rules and enforcement are broken. Wasn't, are They're broken. broken. We have worked tirelessly My to My question to you, Ms. Shipman, and I'm the one asking the questions here as a United States member of Congress, is do you believe that he should be removed as chair? Because currently he's listed as chair on Columbia University's website. I don't believe any professor at Columbia should say anything like what our professors have to be held to a higher standard than our students and i can tell you that but you can't board, you can't say at this te that this hearing that he should be removed as chair even though he violates university rules i would not want him as chair and we are looking at the issue of faculty and mr what we greenwald expect do you think he should be removed as chair his comments are abhorrent and i believe that one of the steps that we could take uh in terms of discipline is to remove them from that leadership position. Thank you Correct. for that direct answer. And just to let you know, uh, Mr. Abdu is not grading papers right now. He's on campus at the unsanctioned anti-Israel, anti-Semitic uh, event that is being supported by pro-Hamas activists on campus. So that's what Professor Abdu is doing at this very moment. I'll give you back your time. Okay. Um, uh, a Jewish member of the School of Social Works faculty told the New York Times, quote, when Jews speak up in our school, they are met with, you have white privilege, so shut up, you're a colonizer, you're an oppressor, you are reprehensible for the deaths of innocent Palestinians. Um, you want to comment on that, and then I'll give you a comment on that, and how can you get this sort of rhetoric out of your faculty? Hmm. I find those remarks reprehensible and uh, I How does not this agree with them. That's not the question. They're obviously indefensible. What is going on here? You guys talk about diversity. How in the world does this happen? Congressman, there are 4,700 faculty at Columbia and most of them are doing up? an out. I said there are 4,700 faculty at Columbia and most vast majority are dedicated. Okay, I'll, I'll, give, you a, I'll give you what I think the gist of the problem is. You guys talk about diversity. Could you give me a ballpark, school of social work, or your faculty across the board of your law school, how many you think are more on the Republican-leaning side and how many are the Democrat-leaning side? Mm. I am personally incredibly committed to viewpoint Pardon? diversity. I am personally incredibly committed to viewpoint diversity and is one of the things that I want to bring to Columbia. I do not know the answer to that because we ballpark. don't ask people. I honestly can't answer that because 
how I many, do, do you just in your own mind, could you rattle off like 10 Republican-ish faculty out of your 4,000 off the top of your head? Yeah, I could actually, but um, you know, I, I did an event just last week uh, with uh, Joe Stiglitz, who's an economist, who's a Democrat, and Glenn Hubbard, who is a Republican. We have two of our uh, fellows from our Institute for Global Politics who are former Trump oh, administration now, Let me officials. give you another question. On December 6, the student group Columbia Social Workers for Palestine held this disruptive probe terrorism teach-in inside the school's lobby in which they said on October 7th, the Palestinian liberation fighters demonstrated their refusal to be dominated and call their effort a heroic struggle for libertation. For, uh, libertation. Dean Melissa Begg initially canceled the event because of its advertising, but later she changed her mind and decided to, to have the event. Were any of these students disciplined or what, what type of message do you think that sent? I believe some of those I believe those students were were identified and uh, and there was they went through a disciplinary process. According to a current student, uh, on October 10th, a request by Jewish students to the DEI office to designate a room to grieve the mass murder of Jews, something that should be perfunctorily agreed. Uh, it, uh, con concern about the optics, given the lack of a sim similar uh, room for Palestinian students. Was it inappropriate to deny Jewish students their request? You think they should have been given that room or not? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear exactly. The, uh, deny them access the room that they would request it to book? Is that the question? You got to speak yes, up. Yes, I believe, yes. I, I think they should have been allowed, and I believe that was corrected later. Why didn't you aim the, for a little uh, more Mr. ideological diversity on your campus? Mr. Grossman, I have a your question. time is up. Uh, Mr. Sablon, you're recognized you. for five minutes. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, welcome to the witnesses um, and to everybody in, in this room. Uh, I have a question. Um, well, anti-Semitism exists. We know it's a problem. It's a major problem. Islamophobia exists. It's a major problem. You know, all kinds of different. But you at Columbia, you know it exists, right? I'll, any one of you. Anti-Semitism is a problem at your school. Yes. Yes. It's a problem in many other schools and in many other places in the nation and in the world. Yes. At Columbia, you are all working to try as much as possible to fix or fix this problem, right? That's what I gather from all of you today. Am I we correct? Are. Yes. 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 Thank you. Now, there's a, I've been here 16 years. Not, I'm not that long, but uh, there's a trick here in, in hearings where I ask you a question, and before you give me an answer, I throw in another question. So, Dr. Shafik, is there some things you would like to say when you were so unceremoniously cut off from giving an answer to questions you were asked by United States members of Congress? Please. I guess, I guess what I'd say is um, I am personally very committed to viewpoint diversity at Columbia, and I'm very personally committed to making sure that our faculty do not cross the line in terms of discrimination and harassment. We, ha we have mechanisms that are now being enforced, and on my watch, they will be enforced. I think many of these appointments were made in the past in a different era, uh, and that era is done. Dr. Uh, Professor Shafir, do you have anything to add, sir, to what you have been asked already? At the moment, no. No, nobody cut you off. Great. Um, <laughs> uh, Ms. Shipman, I know somebody cut you off. you have something to add? Uh, these are all legitimate questions. I, I understand the urgency, uh, I and I appreciate yeah. that we're here. Okay, you don't. No. Mr. Greenwall, sir? Uh, nothing else at the moment. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here, uh, expecting all of these things, but I, am, I, I can see that you are all aware of the issue. You're working towards the issue. I don't know if what you guys figure out to do as your policy in Columbia University will be a policy we can copy and fix 
all the problems we have in the world. This is an ancient problem, like Ms. Shipman said. It will take time and effort to fix it. Just as, you know, we still have to fix and women rights, human rights, you know, employee, everything. So many things, but at Columbia, I am confident, I am convinced that you guys are, know the problem exists and that you are trying to do something to fix it. And for that, I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sablon. Mr. Allen, you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Chair Wellman. Um, well, as you can see, uh, it, I think the concern is unanimous. We've all been troubled by uh, anti-Semitic activities occurring at your campus and, and around the country um, and around the world. Um, as the oldest and most established democracy in the region, Israel exemplifies the core values of freedom and democracy. Um, in fact, I tell my colleagues that Washington, D.C. is not the center of the universe. Jerusalem <coughs> is the center of the universe. Uh, in fact, uh, I read and research that you have a undergraduate and graduate degree a school of religion at Columbia University. Is that correct? We have uh, affiliated institutions, Union Theological Seminary <coughs> and the Jewish Theological Seminary, as well yeah. as a Department of Religion at Columbia. <coughs> All right. In that degree program, I'm not, I didn't research exactly what you teach, mm -hmm. but are you familiar with Genesis 12.3? Probably not as well as you are, Congressman. <laughs> Well, it's pretty clear it was the covenant that God made with Abraham. And uh, that covenant was real clear. Uh, if you bless Israel, I will bless you. If you curse Israel, I will curse you. And then in the New Testament, it was confirmed that all nations would be blessed through you. So you, you do not know about that. I have heard that now that you've explained okay. it. Yes, so I have heard it, that it's before. It's now familiar. Uh, do you consider that a serious issue? I mean, do you want Columbia University to be cursed by God of the Bible? <laughs> Definitely not. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good. So here, here, here's the deal. Uh, we got free, freedom of speech in this country and freedom of religion. Yet we also have Moses looking down on the entire body of Congress who gave us the law, which uh, most of our laws were made and are supposed to be enforced, came from the original law. And what we have today is a lawless land. We have lawless universities that are overrun by people who are threatening to kill other students, who are attacking other students and creating fear in this country, and we have a constitution that, that, re, that requires us to treat other folks as we would like to be treated, which is also in the New Testament. I mean, maybe you should have a course, and you know, you don't have to believe it, but you know, the Bible is an incredible book. There's a lot of history there, and you don't have to believe it. But you need to know what's in there. Maybe you should have a course suggested for those who are having problems with all of this uh, on the Bible and what's in the Bible and kind of what will happen if, you know, under the wrath of God. I mean, uh, we have above the American flag in our chamber, in God we trust. I mean, what God is that? Uh, do you understand why we're here? This is a serious issue. Would any of the other board care to, what do you know about this issue and, 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 and how do you feel about it? I mean, what are your feelings on uh, what, young people are being indoctrinated by these professors to believe this stuff and they have no idea that they're gonna be cursed by God, the God of the Bible and the God over our flag. What are your thoughts? Congressman, my thoughts are that you are right, that we have a moral crisis 
on our campus. And I find, as I've said, you're probably tired of hearing it, I find the behavior of some of our students, some of our faculty, unacceptable. <clears throat> and I think we have a variety of tools to deal with it. We have to be able to have rules that make sense. We have to be able to enforce them because people learn from consequences. We have to have order. And then we need deep anti-Semitism training, as we heard the Congresswoman talk. This is essential. We must train people on what, what well, this I'm, is. And finally, I'm just about I think out of time, but you need to know education. that uh, also, you know, with education is important, knowledge is important, but the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Ms. Stevens, you're recognized for five minutes. Dr. Shafiq. Uh, is it safe to say that 99% of your students are over the age of 18? Do you happen to know how many are under the age of 18? Yes, that is safe to say. The, the, so we've got the undergrads, we've got the graduates, we have adult students, and I'm in the minority party, so we didn't have uh, a ton of say in who was participating in today's hearing, and we've had several hearings about rising anti-Semitism and abhorrent anti-Semitism, and I see that there are students in this audience and there are students uh, outside this committee room, and your voices are entirely important here, and your lived experience is very important. I certainly have um, the where were you on 10-7 moment. I was with Jewish constituents at home when I was seeing this war unfold and uh, the, the horrors unfold. And my immediate thought was, oh dear, our college campuses are going to erupt. I have been a member of Congress who's been very dedicated to the Jewish student experience and the protection of it. And we are, throughout this country, tragically and alarmingly at a boiling point as it pertains to anti-Semitism on college campuses. And to every single person in this room wearing the kippah, who is a Jewish student, who stands alongside Israel and um, fellow Jewish Americans, you belong and you have a safe space here in the Congress and you deserve to have a safe space on your campus. I personally had no thought of ever applying to Columbia or any of these other fancy universities that were coming to our committee to talk about what's going on. But I think we'd be having a much better hearing if we had students here. I had the privilege of talking to a Columbia uh, Jewish student uh, just yesterday, and what he shared with me was unbelievable. I, I don't know what's going on with you all in the administration. Frankly, you have a D report card from the ADL. I, I hear you that you say these things are terrible, and yet they're happening. So the message to the students, and I was an anti-war protester in college myself. I was there when we went into Iraq. I did not want to see us do that. But you cannot call out war while calling out the death and destruction of another group of people. You cannot do that. So, and I, you know, protests and events, they get unwieldy. I'm an elected official. I have town halls and all this and that, and we understand what happens. But let's be really clear here about human dignity and where we are going. We have a vote that we are taking in the next day or two, a resolution on condemning Iran's uh, attacks on Israel. Again, it's from the majority party. I'd like to, as a Congress, be having more nuanced conversations and protections. I come from a very diverse, beautiful place in this country, and I listen and I you know, hear from all of my constituents all over. But where and how are we gonna stand up if we're against war and we're against death and destruction here as a Congress? We, we've gotta take responsible votes. And so to, to the students, I think that's how I wanna use my time I want, I want to see Columbia and all these other places that are failing on their ADL report card to improve. We've got, to, we've got to improve and we've got a responsibility to improve. We're doing it in the Congress. We employ young people here. We have interns here. I yield back. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Mr. Banks, you're recognized for five minutes. Uh, President Shafiq, I understand you're very proud of the Columbia University School of Social Work, right? Yeah, it's the oldest social work school in the country. Yeah, so um, can you define for us the word Ashka normativity? I am not familiar with that term. I believe it appeared in a student glossary that was prepared by a group of students. It, it appears in the orientation guidebook that's given to all of the students at the School of Social Work, but you can't define it for us? No, I'm saying, I, I, I'm not. You seem I, to be familiar. I, I, I've, I, I'm not, I don't use that term, I don't know that term. I believe that glossary was prepared by students for other students. Uh, I don't think it's a part of But it's handed out, you agree, it's handed out to all of the students who, the, at the orient, I mean, that, that's what it is. It's the orientation glossary of terms for incoming students at the School of Social Work. So I, I don't think it's a product of the School of Social Work. I think a group of students put this together. It's handed so. out to students at the School of Social Work. Let me, let me read to you how, it, how Ashka normativity is defined by your, uh, you seem to, you don't know if it comes from students or it, professors it at the students. school, but Ashka normativity is defined as a system of oppression that favors white Jewish folks based on the assumption that all Jewish folks are uh, Ashkenazi or from Western Europe. So do you, do you have a response to that definition of Ashka normativity? Is that appropriate? You know, this is handed out to your students. By other students. It is not a product of the faculty of Columbia University. It is University. handed out I, to your I, students. You know. you, obviously, you, you, you allow this to be handed out to your students. Is that appropriate? As I said, it is not a product of the faculty or the administration. It is something that a group of students produced. Uh, I, don't I don't agree with it. I think it's not very useful. Uh, I don't condone it. Okay, can you help me understand something else? I didn't go to an Ivy League school, admittedly. What, can, you you, can you explain why the word folks is spelled F-O-L-X throughout this guidebook and in other places at the School of Social Work? What does that mean? I'm, serious question. They don't know how to spell? I, I, I mean, I'm not familiar with that yeah, I, spelling. I'm not, I, I, I don't find it a laughing matter. No, I'm, I, I'm not laughing either. I you're, think it's, you're, I, I'm You're I really denying that this really, is a official product of the school, but this is handed out to all of you. You are aware that it's handed out to all of your students, and you're not doing anything to stop it. As I said, it's not an official product of the administration. Is it this is how Columbia University students, spells the word folks? No. Okay. And does, does Columbia University recognize the word? It, because it's not found in the Webster's dictionary or anywhere else, Ashka normativity. Right. Is, that a, is that an acceptable term at Columbia University? Congressman, I am, I am with you. <laughs> I, you know, I, I agree with you that I, I don't find this a okay. it, meaningful this is, this way. Is, of, this is handed out on your watch. As I said, this is not a product of Columbia to the, University to the board, to the, faculty. The, the, the board of trustees, so. do you, is this appropriate? Either one of you? That term is shockingly offensive. It's ridiculous. Congressman. Ma'am? Uh, we had discussions about that memo on, on the board, and my understanding is that uh, we have asked that anything that is uh, looking as though it's orientation materials in any way uh, be run by the dean, and I think that is, is the agreement. As uh, President uh, Shafiq has said, we're not going to be able to limit what individual students say to each other. We don't like it. It's not the kind of learning we promote at Columbia, obviously. But you understand how this fosters an environment of anti-Semitism when the president even admits that she doesn't know if this is an official document of the school or written by students, but it's still, it's still allowed to be handed out to your students. It's outrageous. And it fosters, it's the reason that we hold this hearing, it fosters an environment of anti-Semitism at your university. Are you, president, are you gonna stop this from being handed out again to incoming students at the orientation of the School of Social Work? We will make sure that it is not part of any of orientation process that the can, university uh, President, runs. can you, uh, Shafiq, can you, can you name a real world example of a system of oppression that favors white Jewish folks? Can you give us an example? No. Do you believe that white Jewish folks are privileged, that they're oppressors? No. Do you believe that? No. 
This is what's being fed to your students. It's despicable. You haven't done anything about it. You should do something about it. I yield back. Thank you. Um, if this is a document produced by the students, I'd be interested in knowing if Columbia is paying for this document to be produced to distribute and be distributed. Um, Ms. Leisure Fernandez, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member, and thank you to the witnesses for joining us today. The anti-Semitism experienced by Jewish students at Columbia University and, and universities across the country is unacceptable. I've met with several uh, Jewish students from, uh, not several, but lots of Jewish students from across the country who've endured a wave of slurs and threats, and my heart breaks each time I hear those stories, which I think it breaks for everybody on this committee and on uh, the panel. But anti-Semitism is a centuries-old form of hatred rooted in white supremacy. It's also a form of hatred that has sadly been stoked and given a platform by some in the Republican Party. Madam Chair, I'd like unanimous consent to enter into the record the article from Politico titled, open quote, Donald Trump dined with white nationalist Holocaust denier Nick Fuentes. Without objection. In case we don't remember President Trump's remarks after the anti-Semitic white nationalist rally in Charlottesville in 2017, Madam Chair, I'd like unanimous consent to enter into the record the article from The Atlantic titled, open quote, Trump defends white nationalist protesters. Some very fine people on both sides, close quote. Without objection. This committee has held three hearings on anti-Semitism on college campuses, but not one of these hearings has considered a bill to actually address the scourge of anti-Semitism. In fact, last fall, House Republicans proposed a 25% budget cut to the office that's actually investigating and can take action against universities if there is anti-Semitism on campuses that is actionable. The committee could be more productive on this issue and hold a hearing on Congresswoman Manny's bipartisan, bicameral bill, H.R. 7921, the Countering Anti-Semitism Act. The bill would designate a senior official at the Department of Education to counter anti-Semitism on college campuses, among other solutions, provide data, get us the information we need so we can actually take action, because we must do more than complain. We need to take action. We need to actually have solutions. Dr. Scheiser, as co-chair of Columbia's Task Force on Anti-Semitism, would you support the kind of legislation that gives us more data and a mechanism to fight anti-Semitism? Data is critical because we need to know more about the issues that we're addressing. And I've seen Congresswoman Manning's bill, and I think it is very well crafted. Thank you. I, it has lots of provisions that actually would assist with uh, the issues that we've heard about today. I'd also point out that anti-Semitism isn't the only form of hatred rising in our schools. It's not the only form of hatred that is impacting our children's or students' ability to learn. Uh, Islamophobia and hate crimes against LGBTQ students have also recently spiked. They've led to deaths by suicide, harassment, um, but this committee has not held a single hearing on these issues. The rise in hatred across the United States is not good for learning, it's bad for democracy. We need to find a way to heal and have our students and have our entire nation understand that we are indeed one nation under God, different forms of gods that we worship. But that when we can come to understand each other as related and as connected and respect each other and not tear each other down, that is when we truly start learning to prosper and thrive. And I look forward to working on the kinds of solutions that get us to this point. I hope this committee can be part of the solutions. <coughs> and with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Owens, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, back in December, I made a statement 
that I've seen this movie before, and that seems like it's not, not changed. I grew up in the Deep South, 1960s, days of KKK, Jim Crow, and segregation. My first exposure to white Americans wasn't until I was 16 years old. I was one of four black athletes, denigrated formerly all-white high school, and remember vividly the morning, the morning after Martin Luther King's assassination, walking to our high school courtyard and seeing uh, spray painted on, on the wall in red, ding dong, the king is dead. Let's fast forward to the experience of 2024. If I came to Columbia, Columbia campus, what would be the response if members of my race were harassed by KKK bigots, mocked, called an N-word, spit upon, hit with a stick, ostracized, would these same bigots and racists be allowed to protest at Columbia's campus spewing anti-hate, anti-black uh, hate speech? And instead of wearing the white KKK hoods, would these cowards be granted free speech status as they hit their faces behind black masks and, and full head scarves. At a total cost of $90,000 per year, would black students be forced to attend the class of a tenured Columbia student, uh, professor who are discussing the past events of a massacre of black men and women and children, black girls being raped and black men being lynched, would, and would speak in glowing terms of this event as stunning, awesome, and astonishing? President, I'd like to ask you, would this treatment of black Americans be tolerated for one second? What you've described, Congressman, is completely unacceptable. I, too, grew up in the South in the 1960s and share that experience. So, so yes and or no, would this be tolerated for one second? I beg your pardon. Would this be tolerated, this treatment of black Americans, for one second on Columbia's campus? Absolutely not. And okay. we, we I, I just want to continue this because if this would not be tolerated for blacks, why has it been for months and years? We're talking about a professor who goes back 20 years now. This, this guy has been around a long time. So why is it that Jewish Americans can then be treated by these, bigot, these billy, uh, bigots and bullies in this manner? It is not tolerated and it is not acceptable. And over the last six months, we have done everything we can and have worked tirelessly to improve our policies. Okay, okay. Our, let, me, let, me just, let me just say this real quickly. Let me tell you why I think these two standards are prevalent. At Columbia Core, at Columbia's, the core teaching values are DEI and CRT, which are racist and anti-Semitic uh, teachings of Marxism. The racist beliefs are that blacks are hopeless, weak, and oppressed race that needs protection and pity of the white race. Anti-Semitic beliefs are that Jewish race are the oppressed, oppressor race and that all minorities need to, be, need to be protection from them and therefore hate it. If you ever wonder why the heinous crimes of October 7th never move the needle of empathy at Columbia, this is why. I personally think that it takes a true lowlife, repugnant human being to make the statement that the massacre of innocent men and women, men, women and children, the raping of girls, the beheading of children, the burning alive of human beings is, was stunning, awesome, and astonishing. But what truly speaks volumes is the moral compass of Columbia, that this rabid anti-Semite is still on your payroll today. He's gotten cocky, and for 20 years he's done the same thing. It's just a, a little tip of the iceberg of what's going on there and what's being taught in our classes. There's a statement from a, a, student, a Jewish student. It is impossible to exist as a Jewish student at Columbia without running face first into anti-Semitism every single day. Jew hatred is so deeply embedded into the ca uh, campus culture that has become casual among students, faculty, and neglected by administrators. Do you agree with this statement, President? I have met those students and heard those words in the listening sessions that I have been holding. I believe in leadership by presence and walking around, and I have listened to those students, and it has distressed me hugely. Let, let me, let me I, just, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I hate to, to cut you off. I just have a few seconds here. Uh, let me tell you what my major concern is. Thousands of Columbia students coming from countries that hate America and the other democracy in that region, Israel. How does this work? International students paying a total of 90000 a year up front, skip classes to demonstrate, bully Americans, burn American flags, stop traffic in our countries as they shout death to America. In some kind of way, they still get a degree. I think most of us, unless they're genius, most of us spend 100% of our time trying to, to pass our courses, particularly $90,000 per year. Uh, I'm running out of time. I'll just say this. 
I'd like to know how many of these folks are actually graduating and what degrees are and how they're getting paid to come to our campus and, and, and bully our kids the way they are right now. And I, with that, I'd like to yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Hayes, you're recognized for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you. I'd like to start before I get into my questions by saying that I am a woman of deep personal faith. And my faith forces me to respect the faith of others. So the injection of biblical theology into this um, committee hearing is inappropriate. But if we were to talk about that, I would say that my faith is used as a shield to protect others and not a sword to hate or harm others. I guess I call myself a Matthew 25 Christian. But there's a few things that I would like to clarify or have the witnesses clear up before I um, get into my questions. Professor Sh uh, Schizer, my colleague suggested that students are getting away with hitting Jewish students on campus. Can you clarify that if someone physically attacks another student, that it's not just anti-Semitism, it is also assault? Absolutely. And does the university take action in those matters? The university has to take action in those matters. Thank you. Dr. Shafiq, it's my understanding that the committee was told yesterday that Professor Massad is under investigation. Is that correct? I think I would like to confirm that in writing, if you don't mind. I, as, I can't hear your answer. I said I would like to confirm that in writing. And can you also clarify that he no longer holds a leadership position? I would like to confirm that in writing. And I'm happy to follow up with the committee on that matter. Thank you. Can you get those things to the committee as soon as this concludes? Absolutely. I would appreciate that. There's no place for discrimination in education. No place at all. It should be the goal of all institutions at every level to create safe environments for students, free from harassment and violence. The rise in anti-Semitism on college campuses is unacceptable. According to the ADL, who released data yesterday, 2023 was the worst year for anti-Semitic incidents since the ADL began recording more than four decades ago. There were 8,873 incidents reported across the United States in 2023, an increase of 140% compared to 2022, which was also a record-setting year. According to that same report, Connecticut saw a 170% increase in anti-Semitic incidents in 2023. Islamophobia and anti-Muslim sentiments have also increased on college campuses. I applaud the Biden administration for, le for releasing the national strategy to counter anti-Semitism and the investigations by the Department of Education, Office of Civil Rights for Anti-Semitism at Higher Education Institutes. This is not a problem that any one person or one group can solve, and we should be working here today on solutions. It is equally as important for school administrators to change the culture on their campuses. President Sheree, in your testimony, you stated that in October 2023, you quickly formed a task force. In the March 2024 report, the task force made a series of recommendations that we heard today. Can you tell us, has Columbia University begun to implement any of the recommendations made by the task force? And if so, what are they? Yes, we have. In fact, our new demonstration policy was endorsed by the task force, and they had input into the idea of basically setting aside space where demonstrations can happen so students who don't want to hear certain words don't have to hear them. And that is already now implemented. Uh, we are are there any, I'm sorry, are there any enforcement mecha mechanisms for those policies? Yes, if students don't adhere to those uh, rules, the demonstration policy outlines a series of, uh, of disciplinary measures that would result. Thank you. And I know that there's a challenge of creating rules that appropriately distinguish between free speech and hate speech. But can you tell me what impact would an increase in funding have on the department's ability to respond to the rise in anti-Semitism? You heard my colleagues say that funding that does specifically this uh, has been cut. Is that to me? Yes. yes. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, we would. Um, 
we know that there's a number of cases before the Department of Education around these issues. We would welcome guidance from the Department of Education as we try and define the boundaries, particularly around speech. So it but would be guidance helpful without to us. money will not help you achieve these goals. Yeah, it would be helpful, uh, I think, from our perspective to get such information. Thank you. I have no further questions. I yield back. Thank you, Mrs. Hayes. Mr. Good, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I'll direct this first to uh, Dr. Shafiq. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it say about college campuses like Columbia's today that we're sitting here having a congressional hearing to discuss significant anti-Semitism prevalent to a large degree on campuses like yours and pro-terrorism sympathies, sympathies on campuses like yours. How troubling is that to you? What does it say about our college campuses today that we're here doing this? I am very troubled. Uh, I, I would say that we have 37,000 students, and I think the numbers that we are talking about who are crossing these lines are, you know, a very, very small number. Hey, of let me stop you there. Students. Let me stop you there. Have there been any anti-Islamic demonstrations on campus, any anti-Muslim demonstrations on campus, any anti-Arab demonstrations on campus, anything like that happened? There have been uh, many pro-Israeli demonstrations okay, on our no, campus. that's not what I asked you. But there have been, and, and then there, and there have been many incidents. The answer would be no, correct? Uh, the, yes, uh, sorry. Okay, uh, thank you. There would be uh, to the board members, oh, if I may, how, what does it say about our college campuses today that we're having a hearing about anti-Semitic uh, sympathies on campus, expressions on campus on a large scale, and pro-terrorist expressions on campus on a significant scale? What does that say about college campuses today like Columbia's? Anyone want to answer that? Congressman, I think it says we have a lot of work to do. It's shocking. What does it say about what's happening on our college campuses that this would even be an issue to such large degree that we're holding yet another congressional hearing on this subject? I think, um, personally, I, uh, I think it says that we have lost our way in terms of what we expect from each other in a learning community and in our society. I think we have got to learn to listen to all sorts of diversity, and we have to commit to um, speech that isn't laced with hate and isn't just meant to mm. provoke for... for um, right. Th thank, you. thank you very much. appreciate your efforts to try to answer that. Uh, <laughs> President Shafiq, as you know, on March 24, just three weeks ago, and five months after the October 7 terrorist attack in Israel, a coalition of a reported 94 Columbia student organizations led by Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Force for Peace held an event with, with guest speakers who are connected to and supportive of known terrorist organizations. Uh, Khalid Barakat spoke at the event. He's been identified as a member of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a group that we, the United States, has designated a foreign terrorist organization. Another speaker was Charlotte Cates, who's affiliated with the Palestinian Prisoner Solidarity Network, which is designated uh, as a terrorist group by Israel. What does it say that we allowed that event to take place on campus, remotely, but hosted on campus, held on campus? What does that say about Columbia today? We did not allow that event to happen. We were the students applied to host that event at Columbia. We twice said no. They then tried to host it at our neighbor, Barnard, who also said no. They then decamped to a dorm room and held it online. We immediately, as soon as we knew, notified the FBI. We brought in special investigators well, and we let me suspended stop you there. When, the students involved. When did you involved. learn about this event taking, was going to take place or was being tried to be held to take place? We learned on the day and then we immediately contacted the Were FBI. Were any safe spaces provided or other supportive measures created for students who might have felt threatened by the efforts to have this on campus, to have these speakers speaking remotely, at least on campus. Was there any measures taken for those students who might have felt threatened by this? They were in a, in a private space. Uh, they were, and, and as I said, all of the students who, involve, who were involved in organizing that event have been suspended. All right, one and of the primary organizers organizer of the event was the Students for Justice in Palestine, which was suspended on November 10, but that was four months before the event took place. Mm -hmm. How could they be able to organize an event on campus? I mean, what, what entities or groups are, would you prohibit from organizing an event on campus? What's the criteria for approval or disapproval to be able to do that? 
So we were one of the first universities to suspend Students for Justice in Palestine and the Jewish Voices But they were for still Peace. able to be, hold an event. <laughs> because, be, because they it didn't abide by our rules and held unsanctioned events. We quickly realized, uh, I think that was a very powerful symbol to say if student groups don't abide by the rules, they, there will be consequences uh, for I'm, them. I'm sorry, with eight seconds left, I'm going to have to stop you. The Columbia University newspaper contained an op-ed from the Columbia University Apartheid Divest signed by 94 supporting student groups that were part of the coalition uh, with Students for Justice for Palestine that host, organized the event. I would just like a response afterwards in writing as to whether or not these groups who were also supported, the other 94 groups, mm -hmm whether or not they would have been suspended or have funds pulled or any consequences of those other 94 groups, as reported in the Columbia University newspaper. Apologize, Madam Chairman, for going over a little bit. I yield back. Thank you. Um, the, your request to have an answer is duly noted. Uh, Mr. Desanya, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank all the witnesses for being here. Um, Ms. Shipman, I was taken by your comment about when you were a young person and went to Columbia from the Midwest that you, you, you were taught not, you were taught how to think, not what to think. And in that context, we're dealing with a complex issue, historically, thousands of years um, in this instance, but the use of technology and political consultants, the theater of today is, is quite remarkable where you have a real legitimate, and I appreciate the bipartisan focusing on the legitimate um, issues around hatred and prejudice. So, but the technology to me is really fascinating. What makes this so unique to our time in this institution? Um, Professor, have you looked at that in terms of social media um, and how we are, there's a lot of work around this in this field, not in this specific field, uh, by researchers at UVA, um, Harvard, I think of Susan Lynn, her wonderful book about who's minding our kids how we're using what we've discovered about neuroscience, including prejudice and hatred and emotion, and using technology to make it much worse for very narrow political um, reasons. Have you looked at that? And I'd like to follow up, given your history, Ms. Shipman, um, in your career about how things have changed in that regard, about how people get information and how it's manipulated as we, as a culture and a civilization, try to figure out what the guardrails are and the damage it causes in the meantime. Start with you, Professor. This is a yeah. question for me, right, no, sir? No, first for you, have you looked at social media yes. and how people get information? Congressman, it is, it is very important that you raise that issue because one of, the, one of the most frustrating aspects of this is that people are posting anonymously and they are posting absolutely horrible, horrible things. And so the, there are frustrations for all of us in trying to figure out how to stop that but more fundamentally, we are very mindful of the destructive aspect of this hate speech on social media. And it's not organic in many ways. It's, it's deliberately directed by people who want to divide people and create problems. Have you looked at that? And I'm thinking of a book, uh, The Chaos Machine, by a New York Times reporter who was the person who actually reported that YouTube was directing adolescent girls right to the point where they could be through their depression and anxiety to show them how to commit suicide. So this is being used in these political environments is my point right now. It's very troubling, yes. Ms. Shipman, and the point that it's not organic, that it's quite deliberate, whether it's people in Russia or people in the United States doing this to people to divide us, as opposed to your career, or how it's evolved from your career. I have a lot of thoughts about this, career. so I'm just trying to gather my thoughts. I think we, um, this is an issue that our university has been investigating for a long time in terms of the science, the neuroscience, uh, the, the flow of information at our journalism school. We have so many ways to, to look at this in an important way for our society. Um, I know we're working with a, a Nobel Prize winner, Maria Ressa, on this issue right now of disinformation. But I'll say a couple of things. I think the most fundamental thing I've learned in my time on the board at Columbia is that, um, and this is from our incredible Mind Brain Behavior Institute, which is just cutting edge neuroscience. When people feel fear and intimidation, they can't learn. And so I think I come back to the topic of this hearing that we, we can look at all of the reasons why there's certainly new ways we all hate each other in our society right now that are distressing. But I think if we cannot provide 
fundamental safety for our students, we now know we're not just guessing that we're not allowing them to learn. And I wonder if you have any comments or observations. Congressman, you are absolutely right that social media is part of the problem of, and, and on this particular issue, we have seen it as pernicious. Uh, I am particularly uncomfortable with some of the anonymous channels, uh, things like side chat. Uh, every student I meet, I tell them, please get off side chat, it's poisonous. Uh, and probably the most egregious cases that we've seen of anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, racist comments have been on social media, on those anonymous channels, and we would welcome any any improvement in content moderation, which would, would reduce that. No, I really appreciate that. I'm struck by this in the previous hearing that I wonder what Brandeis and Holmes would be talking about if they were alive today. Yeah. And their context of very similar economic and world strife time in World War I were when they were discussing what is free speech and screaming fire in a crowded theater. Mm -hmm. um, I see the social media companies and technology companies as being those folks who are benefiting from strife. And this is sort of an extreme example of how they're making, monetizing us fighting against one another in a very, very difficult position where I think we would all agree that um, hatred and prejudice cannot be tolerated. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Desaigne. Mrs. McLean, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you all for being here today to discuss this very important topic. But I think we have to go back to the beginning and we have to identify the problem before we can really figure out solutions to the problem. So I want to start with you, Dr. Um, Dr. Shafiq. What is your definition of anti-Semitism? For me personally, any discrimination against people for their Jewish faith is anti-Semitism. Okay, I appreciate that. You set up a task force. Do they share that same definition? Congressman, I know the chair of our task force is next, I know, but sitting you're next the to president. me. I'd like to hear from so you I, first. I, I'm happy to answer the question, but so, I, I know uh, he would also I, and probably I'm happy have to do much that, to But I'd like to start with you, since you are yeah. the president, yes. right? You own the buck stops with you. Right? Completely. Um, do they share that same definition? I, I'm pretty sure that they would share that definition. Don't you think that would be a pretty important thing to start with? Yes. Okay. Are you concerned at all about the article um, by Sharon Otterman, wa which indicated that a Columbia University task force set up to combat anti-Semitism on campus in the wake of October 7th, Hamas attack is attempting to avoid one of the most contentious issues in universities debate over, over the war. Its members, this is, now I don't mm. know if it's true or not, so I'd like mm. to get your, your take. Its members have refused to settle on what the definition of anti-Semitism is. Mm. So from your opinion, this is an inaccurate article. Yes, and okay. yes. Uh, Thank you. Professor Schizer would be the best person to give you the I appreciate that. The so, Professor, thank you. Do you um, have a definition of anti-Semitism? Absolutely. Okay, can you share it with us? Sure, it's bias against Jewish people, which can manifest as ethnic slurs, stereotyping, Holocaust denial, double standards as applies to Israel, and anti-Semitic tropes. Wonderful, I appreciate that. So this article is in fact false. It is inaccurate, yes. Okay, thank you. I, th I think we need to really take a look at the facts. So now that we have um, a clear defined definition of what it is. What I'm curious now is what are the consequences to one's actions? Ms. Shafiq, Dr. Shafiq, can you share with us what the consequences are? The consequences for anti-Semitic behavior. I'm sorry? The, the, the consequences for anti-Semitic behavior. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, so we have, uh, one of the biggest things we focused on is we want to make it easy so that if there is any anti-Semitic incident at Columbia, we know about it immediately. We have QR codes all over the campus. Okay. We have a hotline. We have a and single what website is, for and that's reporting. A great, so, that's a great, I'm looking for an answer though. Yeah. What are the consequences for anti-Semitic behavior? Yes, so once we know of an incident, we have, investi we have investigative sure. capacity. We've invested hugely in expanding that investigative capacity. Okay. And depending on the nature of the incident, there are consequences ranging from people uh, being potentially suspended, uh, okay. being forced to get educated and trained about anti-Semitism, 
uh, Wonderful. Being, and we've executed those. So we are executing okay. those, yes. So my question to you, are mobs shouting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, or long live the infantata, are those anti-Semitic comments? When I hear those terms, I find them very upsetting. And I have heard- That's a great answer to a question I didn't ask, so let me repeat the question. When mobs or people are shouting from the river to the sea, Palestine must be free, or long live the infantata, are those anti-Semitic statements? Yes or no? It's not how you feel, it's- I hear them as such, some people don't. We have sent so a clear yes? message- So is that yes? We have sent a clear message to our community. I'm not asking about the message. Yeah. Is that fall under definition of anti-Semitic behavior? Yes or no? Why is it so tough? Because it's a, it's a, it's a difficult issue because it, it, I realize some people it's a hear it as anti-Semitic, but here's the problem not. is and when people can't answer a simple question and they have a definition, but then they can't, well, I'm not really sure if that qualifies. So I'm asking a simple question. Maybe I should ask your task force. Does that qualify as anti-Semitic behavior, those statements, yes or no? Yes, okay. Do you agree with your task force? Yeah, we, we agree. So, the question is yes. what, so the question, what so to do So yes, you it. do agree that those are, that is anti-Semitic behavior and you should be, there should be some consequences to that anti-Semitic behavior. We're in agreement, yes? Yes. Thank you, I yield my time. <laughs> yes. The uh, gentlewoman yields. Pursuant to the previous order, the chair declares this, the committee in recess subject to the call of the chair, but we do plan to reconvene in five minutes. I ask all the guests to remain in their seats until the witnesses are allowed to leave the room. So the committee stands in recess for five minutes.
<laughs> the committee will reconvene and come to order following our recess. Mr. Bowman, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you so, so much, Madam Chair, and thank you to the witnesses for being here. You know, as we all aim to fight and end anti-Semitism once and for all, there is language and there are actions and incidents that take place that are clearly anti-Semitic. And then there are others where someone may have said something or done something that they didn't quite understand, that was wrong. And what I'm hearing from students and people in my district who go to Columbia is they feel that there's not the space for divergent opinions or thoughts as it relates to the state of Israel or what's happening in Gaza right now. Can you speak to how different points of view or perspectives as it relates to the war in Gaza, criticism of the state of Israel, or something like that that is not anti-Semitic, but just a difference of opinion from other students? How, how does that how is that uh, adjudicated or confronted? How are we creating spaces for critical dialogue and discussion that may make people feel uncomfortable, um, but are not like hateful? Can you speak to that first, uh, Madam President? And then we could just go down the line and everyone gives brief comments to that. Congressman, it's a very good point. Uh, we uh, launched uh, at the end of last semester a program called Dialogue Across Difference to do exactly what you're saying, which is to give people tools to have difficult conversations where people disagree but are, um, but are respectful. Uh, and so we've held, there have been maybe at, you know, two to three events per week at Columbia for students and for faculty. Except per week? Yes. Okay. Uh, to, uh, to practice that sort and model that sort of behavior. And are those, are those events well attended by students with different points of view coming together and having this dialogue? That is happening more. I will be candid with you that uh, immediately after October 7th, it, it was the atmosphere very hard. was tense. It was very hard. Yeah. Uh, but that's changing. And I'm doing it myself personally in my listening sessions with students from both sides of the issues. And again, those have been very emotional. Okay. I've had students in tears in of those course, sessions. Of course. Can we go down but quickly? We I know I don't it. have much time. We Can we just it. quickly respond to that? Yep. Thank you for the question. We are committed to in ensuring that students can articulate competing points of view about extremely important issues like the Middle East, like the current war, like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it would be a really, really unfortunate thing and uh, a departure from our mission as a university if we were suppressing points of view. We absolutely don't want to do that. And at the same time, we have free speech. We also have the responsibility not to engage in discrimination. Of course. Now, the time is moving, so I'm going I'm to let you answer, but I'm going to shift a, a, slightly. How are we also fighting other forms of a hate, including Islamophobia, at the university, which I've heard is happening also at the university as well? Can you two quickly respond to that? Uh, we have, um, look, we're listening to all of our students. All hate is... Uh, is just should not be welcome at Columbia. Um, I've personally met with uh, a large number of Jewish students and a lot of our Muslim students from the region who do feel stressed and scared, scared about walking to class. I mean, we, we have to listen and we have to allow for political debate. As Professor Schizer said, that's a bedrock of our democracy. Mm -hmm. I spent five years living in the Soviet Union. I can tell you you don't want no political That's debate. Right. You don't want the result of that. But we can't let political debate cross into hate. We, we have a special yes. job as an educational institution. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mr. Greenwald. All hate is abhorrent. Further, the lessons that we're learning coming out of the task force, mm -hmm. those principles will be applicable not just to anti-Semitism, but to other forms of hate as well. Absolutely. Just to ensure that there are additional voices uh, part of this conversation, 
Um, I want to enter for the record. Um, I have a letter here from over 600 faculty, staff, students, parents, and alumni of Columbia and Barnard expressing their commitment to open, honest inquiry on campus. I ask unanimous consent to enter the letter into the record. Without objection. And in the last 15 seconds that I have, uh, Madam President, can you respond to the, uh, there was a so-called chemical attack on campus at one point targeting um, so-called pro-Palestinian students. Can you quickly respond to that? The, it, it appears to have been an odorous substance that was sprayed on demonstrators. Uh, the individuals involved have been suspended from Columbia. Suspended from the school, so they no longer attend the school. The students Correct. were involved? Correct. Okay, thank you. And I yield back. Thank you. Mrs. Steele, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Dr. Fox. For over two decades, Columbia's Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African Studies Department has been extremely hostile to Israel and Jewish students. Professor Joseph Massad, who vocally praised Hamas, Hamas. Professor Hamid Dabashi, who has made numerous anti-Semitic remarks, including that Israelis have a vulgarity of a character and that is born deep and structured to the skeletal bird, you know, I can't even pronounce vertebrae of its culture. And Rashid Khalidi, a professor of your university now and former PLO sp spokesperson called Columbia Anti-Semitism Task Force bigots and fanatics and right-wingers and extremists. This is all on the record. And do you think this kind of conduct is appropriate and acceptable? And what university took, what kind of action that you took after these professors were talking about like this? Yes. Congresswoman Steele, thank you for that question. Uh, before I answer it, I know Representative Hayes asked me to confirm in writing uh, about in ongoing investigations of some of the faculty that you've described. So I just wanted to confirm now that both Professors Massad and Frankie are currently under investigation for discriminatory remarks. Uh, so I just wanted to put that on the record uh, for, for, this, for this occasion. On the broader point that you raise, I, what I would say is that... Just before you go with that, how about the other two professors? I'm going to come to that. So all three of them. Sorry, which ones are you referring to? Uh, so it's a Professor Joseph Massad. Yes. And Professor Hamid Tabashi. And you hired Rashid Khalidi, professor of un your university, that former PLO spokesperson. Yeah. We don't have any ongoing complaints around those other two professors. But what I would say is, since I have been in this role, which is I'm just entering my ninth month, uh, we have put in place mechanisms so that if faculty cross the line in terms of any harassing or discriminatory behavior, there will be consequences. We can remove people from leadership roles. We can, we can discipline. You know, we can we can remove them from the classroom. We can, in some cases, have uh, removed them from Columbia altogether, and we have several cases like that. So we are making sure that going forward, faculty who cross the line uh, and, and discriminate or harass students uh, on any issue, uh, will uh, there will be consequences. Yeah, you know what? I'm not just making up. This happened, and this is the statement that we just took it out from the uh, you know, newspapers and other media. So you really have to find out. So nothing really happened. These three university professors that what they were talking about Israelis, and then let's just move. Then Columbia alumni have called on university place the department into academic receivership, as it has done for its English and anthropology departments. Will you consider placing the department into receivership? Um, I guess academic departments at Columbia are, um, there isn't really a, a, 
a notion of receivership. But what I would say is one of the things that I'm very committed to is we have a, a broad offering of almost 50 courses on Israeli, Jewish, and Middle Eastern studies at Columbia. But we also have an opportunity, I think, at this moment, because so many students are interested and there's so much demand and need, frankly, for education about this, these issues, that we are looking at expanding and hiring some new faculty to try and broaden our approach to make sure that we have some new and fresh thinking in, in, in the areas of Israeli, Jewish, and Middle East studies. So and what kind of broader thinking? And what well, kind so, of expansion so are you talking about? We will about? be hiring additional faculty going forward uh, that will bring new perspectives. But you're going to do all idea. those background checks and their records, though, because your professors already talk about this kind of you know, statements, and this is not really acceptable. We will, we will do all the background checks that you would expect uh, for our faculty, because it's a privilege to teach at Columbia. Frankly. So it's not just English and anthropology departments, but do you consider the Middle Eastern, South Asian, and African studies department balanced and well-run departments? Because over two decades, they were extremely hostile to Israel. Thank and you, Ms. Steele. They'll be, we'll get answers uh, to your questions. Yeah. Uh, Ms. Omar, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Um, President um, uh, Sh Sh uh, Fik, I wanted to get a clarification earlier. One of my colleagues asked you, have you seen anti-Muslim protests on campus? I have seen, we have, we have had pro-Israeli demonstrations on campus? No, 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 but, but, but just not, a protest that was not, against Muslims. No, I have not. Have you not seen, seen one against Arabs? No, I have not. Have you seen one against uh, Palestinians? No, I have not. Have you seen against one against Jewish people? Have you seen a protest no. saying we are against Jewish people? No, I have, I have seen. Okay, thank, no, thank I, you for that I, clarification. There has been a rise in targeting and harassment against anti-war protesters because it's been pro-war and anti-war protesters is what it seems like, correct? Correct, there has okay. been. Okay, thank you. Um, activists on campus including Jewish students, black and brown, Arab and Muslim students. How many of the organizations that were canceled in Colombia involved Jewish students? One of the organizations is called Jewish Voices for Peace. Yes, and encompassed of Jewish students? Yes. Okay, thank you. There was a, uh, there's, there's been a recent attack um, on the democratic rights uh, of students across the country. I was appalled to learn that in April, Colombia suspended and evicted six students for their involvement in the pro-Palestinian panel event on campus. It happened that all six students were arbitrarily targeted after you, the university brought in a team of private and former police investigators. These investigators harassed, intimidated Palestinian students at their homes, demanding to see students' private text messages and sent threatening emails to the leaders of those pro-Palestinian groups. I would like to ask you to speak a little bit more to this uh, situation and um, ask you if you've if you guys have utilized private uh, former police investigators before or is this the first time so this was a very serious case uh, we had uh, students who on an online if you could shorten your answer that would be really appreciated of course who invited people who were inciting violence and that is unacceptable and so we needed to get to the bottom of it and so that's why we brought private investigators how, along how, with notifying How the secure FBI. were you, these students that you evicted and suspended were involved? Did you do any investigation? Was there a hearing? Did they refused to cooperate with the investigation. And so until they do so, they are suspended. OK, uh, thank you. And then in January, there was an, uh, um, there was an incident involving students that were protesting, that were attacked with a toxical, toxic chemical substance leaving many hospitalized. Um, a lot of them uh, did not receive support from uh, the school administrators. Can you speak to what is happening with the investigation, uh, if you all are um, cooperating, 
and why weren't the students provided any support after they've mm. experienced that attack? Mm. So we, this is still with the police, uh, and uh, as far as we know, it was an, we think it was an odorous substance, uh, and, and we did reach out to all of those students who said they were affected. Many of them didn't want support. We also it, reached out. It took out you guys more than four days to reach out to students. No, I don't believe that's correct. Okay, actually. will you respond? I, uh, give me a written response with the fact that you all responded right away to those students. Yes, I would be happy to do that. All right, appreciate that. And it looks like there's been um, a lot of doxing and and harassment uh, that that has taken place. What protections are students being provided? We created a doxing resources group to support students. There were many students who were affected by this. Muslim students, Jewish students, and completely, you know, other students. Uh, that group has, uh, we had 90 students reach out to that group to get support in terms of both technical support, legal support, privacy scrubbing, and so on. And uh, before I run out of time, I wanted uh, to ask what what do, you, what do your rules say about professors that harass students online, um, like Professor Shai Davidar has done, um, and professors who directly attack you as the president, as a coward and a liar? So as president, I'm used to being attacked. Uh, but attacking our students is unacceptable. And in that case, uh, we've had more than 50 complaints about that professor mm -hmm. uh, and he is currently under investigation okay of, for harassment and I would love a follow up on that as well thank you so much I yield back thank you uh, mr. Kiley you're recognized for five minutes President uh, Shabak, uh, earlier today the question was posed uh, our chance of from the river to the sea uh, anti-semitic and uh, Professor Scheitzer, head of the anti-semitism task force at Columbia said I guess you gave a very clear answer mm -hmm. uh, yes you, on the other hand, uh, hemmed and hawed, and then eventually said, I hear them as such, some people don't. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about there? Who are these people that you're referring to? Well, I think even surveys uh, by the Anti-Defamation League and others have shown that even that some Jewish people don't hear that as anti-Semitic, whereas I would say the majority do. Uh, so it's one of those phrases that is heard differently by So that's men. who you're referring to is, is, is Jewish population, some sector of it? Yeah, some, yes, and I have received uh, letters from our Jewish faculty who say that they also don't think it, should, it, it is anti-Semitic. But I think you're, Congressman, I think you put your finger on a, on, a, on a challenging issue. We have sent a message to our community. All of the deans of Columbia University, all 17 of them for the first time, wrote a letter to the community saying, these words are hurtful and are hurtful. Okay, that, hurtful that's good, way. and I'm glad that Professor Scheitzer was able to give us a very clear answer, yes, but you weren't able to do so. And I think if I were to go through a number of other uh, racial slurs and ask you if those are offensive, if these are racist, I don't think you'd say, I hear them as such, some people don't, would you? I think, I believe, I, I, I'm happy to give you my personal opinion, but I think the question that you're really asking me is, are they forbidden to be said at Columbia? Uh, uh, that's that, not what I'm asking, actually. Okay. Right. I'm, well, then I'm happy I think to we you saw your instinct is okay. that you're, I, I'm wondering who are you risking, who are you worried about offending? That's my no, question. No, no, no. I, I feel like I'm speaking as president of Columbia, so that's the way in which I'm Okay, let's talk about Columbia. Um, are there anti-Semitic professors on your faculty? I certainly hope not, and I, uh, if I have any evidence that they, there are, uh, there you will be consequences. You don't think there's evidence of anti-Semitism among professors on your faculty? We have seen some cases, and there have been consequences. So you mentioned uh, Mr. Uh, Abdu and Mr. Uh, Massad. You said they're both under investigation. Is that correct? Uh, uh, Mr. Massad is under investigation. Mr. Abdu has been uh, told he will not work at Columbia again. He's been fired. He's, he, he is leaving. He's, I don't understand the distinction there. Fired versus he's leaving. Yeah, no, he's, 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 uh, he's leaving, and he has a written record on his record that so says he So wa he wasn't he fired, but he's employed. voluntarily leaving? No, no, no. He's, he's been told he, he can't. He has to leave. He, yeah, he has been I told see. he has to leave. Okay. Um, do you think he is anti-Semitic? You know, he has, he has written and said things which are... Um, in support of Hamas, which I find very problematic. And when, by the way, yeah. was he told to leave? Uh, I want to make sure I have the right date for you, but it was 
in the la you know sometime in the last few weeks is my, is my recollection. In but the I'd last be happy, how long? I'd be happy to get it to you in writing because I want to make sure I give you the right date. Did you uh, retain counsel in preparation for this hearing? We had lots of you know we we did a lot of preparation for this hearing. Yes. Okay. How many hours did you say you spent preparing? Well, this is a very, very serious matter, and so I have spent many, many hours. I many, many hours. Them. And you, <laughs> you've given us very divergent responses as to some of the worst offending professors about how they've been handled. And why is that? Why can't you just give us the facts? I've offered to give you the facts. I'm happy to, to provide you with the details. I just don't recall the exact date when he was notified, and I want to make sure I give you an accurate answer. It's a sure. very serious matter. Would you be willing to make just a statement right now to uh, any members of the faculty at your university that if they engage in anti-Semitic uh, words or conduct, that they should find another place to work? Can you make that statement? I would be happy to make a statement that any anyone, any faculty member at Columbia who behaves in an anti-Semitic way or in any way a discriminatory way should, should find somewhere else to go. Thank you. Do you believe that the BDS movement is anti-Semitic? Yeah. Columbia has on numerous occasions refused to, well, sorry, that's not the right way, uh, has, has, has faced the issue of BDS. In fact, we had a proposal But do you think it's anti-Semitic, uh, the BDS movement? I, th uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a political movement that is advocating a boycott or in a sanctioning process, which is... So once again, who are you worried about offending by, by making a very clear statement on this? No, I'm not making... I'm, I'm happy to make a clear statement on it. Okay. Well, I, I, I want to close my questioning by giving you an opportunity to address some of the students who are here, because we have uh, some really courageous students who have come, who have uh, testified, who have met with our committee, uh, mm -hmm. who were at our press conference this morning. Many of them behind you. Many of them uh, couldn't get into the room because it was too small. And uh, they've told harrowing stories of what they've endured on your campus, and they say that the response of your administration has been inadequate, has been insufficient. So are they wrong? I mean, what would you say to these students? The, I have met with these students myself. In fact, I've met many of the students who are in this room, uh, and we have talked about it. And I think I have assured them that there are times when I have been very frustrated with the policies and capacity that we have at Columbia to respond to this, but I have been working tirelessly to fix those problems and improve our response. And I think we can show concrete improvements in the way we've been handling anti-Semitism during my time. Hey, Thank you, Mr. Kiley. Ms. McBath, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Fox and Ranking Member Scott. Thank you to those of you that are here as our witnesses today, I've read your testimonies. Uh, we have a, we've had a multiple of hearings on this issue of anti-Semitism on campuses, and I really do appreciate the chair's commitment to continuing to have these conversations. Thank you. During one of them, I brought up the Anti-Defamation League's most recent data from their annual audit of anti-Semitic incidents and I shared alarming data about the frequency of these acts of hate. Last time this data was published, it translated to over 10 incidents a day, a disturbing amount that's truly in its own right. According to the newest data published just a few days ago, that number has now skyrocketed to 24 incidents per day, basically one per hour. This is absolutely heartbreaking and truly unacceptable, and it shows the depth of the work that we must continue to champion. Work like the President's National Strategy to Counter Anti-Semitism and providing the support necessary to the Office of Civil Rights at the Department of Education. Increasing funding would truly ensure that the resources necessary are available so that we can look back a year from now and hopefully be able to say that we did not have the highest number of anti-Semitic incidents on record, but that is unfortunately not something that I've been able to do or uh, see during my five years here serving on this committee. My community in metropolitan Atlanta, home to the largest Jewish community in the Deep South, is no stranger to any of these kinds of incidents. We see more hatred in our, disc in, in, in our discourse and more violence in our communities than we've ever seen before. Time and time again, anti-Semitic vandalism and white supremacist symbols 
appear in our neighborhoods, in the districts that I represent. And we've stood together in condemning them. Now I understand how important it is for all in our community to support one another, regardless of our faith, regardless of our ethnicity. Many people do not know that a large number of the supporters of the NAACP were Jewish or of communities' collective history and common interests. My father was branch president of the Illinois NAACP during the Civil Rights Movement. And I distinctly remember when our local Jewish community stood up to support us as we were on the front lines fighting, fighting for civil and human rights. And one community that was one of the first to voice support for those of us that were fighting on the front lines. And that had a very serious impact on me. A Jewish professor at Columbia served as NAACP chair in the early 1900s. And I am proud to carry on our long partnership in the fight against racism, hatred, and anti-Semitism. To know that your community stands with you in your greatest hour of need, it means absolutely everything. Mr. Schizer, do you know if Columbia is currently taking any steps to renew their strong legacy of interracial and interreligious connections on campus? I will say this. I am moved by what you said, and I completely agree with it. Issues like racism and anti-Semitism are not partisan issues. They're American issues. And in that spirit, I know President Shafiq has been emphasizing how important it is for us all to come together. And we may not agree. I mean, we absolutely should not agree on everything, but we need to treat each other with respect. And I think her leadership on that issue has been extremely important. Well, thank you for that. So can you then please just talk a little bit about their importance and what the, building those connections and relationships actually looks like on campus? Where are you at? Yes, the President. Oh, yeah. um, Congressman, I completely agree with you, and I think one of the things I've said over and over is that anti-Semitism isn't a problem for Jewish people to solve. It's actually a problem for all of us, and you, I think, said it much better than I have ever said it. We are looking at how to invest more in interfaith dialogue at Columbia. We have a group. I have met with them, uh, but I think at this particular moment, it merits further support in order to rebuild our community. Well, thank you so much. I do appreciate um, all the efforts that I believe everyone in this room really is making. Um, I, don't, I, I, I truly believe in humanity. I truly believe in our ability to put our differences aside for the common good. And I hope that everyone in this room would find it a time such as now to do so. And I yield back. Thank you, Ms. McBath. Mr. Bean, you're recognized for five thank, minutes. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and good afternoon. Columbia beats Harvard and UPenn. Y'all have done something that they weren't able to do. You've been able to condemn anti-Semitism without using the phrase, it depends on the context. But the problem is, the action on campus doesn't match your rhetoric today. And you're saying the right things. You're saying we're not gonna tolerate it, but we see the videos. We see what's happening on social media. And just this morning, all of these students, your students, your students, their message is quite different. Their message is one of fear. How about that? They can't walk across campus without getting the F word yelled at them, F Jews, intifada, all kinds of things. My heart aches for them. It should be hard academically at Columbia, but it shouldn't be hard to walk across campus, and it is. So the so words don't match your actions. And you can have 200 meetings. You can put people on double secret probation as you have. Uh, you can write very strongly worded letters. Don't ever do it again. But that's not solving the problems. Look at the fear in their eyes right now. One of them said this morning in a press conference that we got to spend some time with that security on campus, are you ready for this? Security on campus told them, remove anything that identifies you as Jewish when things get hot. That's the way to stay safe on Columbia's campus is don't look Jewish 
and you'll be, a sa you'll be safe. Is that, what, uh, is that your policy, uh, Madam President, to stay safe? Just don't look Jewish? Not at all. And I think... You know, so the stuff, think, have you met with them? I know you've met, well, I, I know you've met with them 200 times, but why is their message different from yours? Why are they saying it happens all the time, every week, going to class? Are you aware of that? It's a yes or no question. Are you aware that there's a problem on campus? You're aware? Yes is the right answer. You're aware. Uh, as president of the board, uh, Ms. Shipman, uh, thank you for being here. Are you aware, though, that this once prestigious university's reputation is just going down the toilet uh, because of all of the anti-Semitism that's flourishing on campus. Are you aware? I'm aware of how serious this moment is. I appreciate your urgency. We're not done. I have recognize we, have what we Have we quadrupled security on campus? Have we, have we expelled students? How many students have we expelled? We have massively increased our security capacity. Have we expelled anybody? There's so many hate groups on campus. Uh, I just, I want y'all to know there's got to be, you sh this is America. It's 2024 and you shouldn't fear going to the library just because of your faith. Madam Chair, I yield the rest of my time to the gentle lady from New York, Ms. Stefanik. Dr. Shafiq, you answered one of the questions of our colleagues across the aisle. You said there has been no anti-Jewish protests. Do the other individuals on the panel agree with that? Start with you, Professor Skizer. So I think there have been anti-Semitic protests, so I would say yes. So you disagree? There have been anti-Jewish protests. Ms. Shipman? I know there have been a number of incidents, especially one at our law school recently, that um, the students were trying to call a protest, but it was uh, an event to harass uh, admitted students who were Jewish, and it's outrageous. So that's anti-Jewish, so the answer would be yes? Yes. And Mr. Greenwald? Uh, there have been anti-Semitic events on campus, uh, which I interpret as anti-Jewish. And Dr. Shafiq, you realize that at some of these events, the slurs and the chants have been, F the Jews, death to Jews, yep. F Israel, no safe place, death to the Zionist state. Jews out. You don't think those are anti-Jewish? Completely anti-Jewish. Completely unacceptable. So you changed your testimony Horrible. on that issue as well? So there have been anti-Jewish protests. I, I didn't get to finish my sentence. So what I was going to say was there were protests that were called that were... that. That's not what you were asked. You were asked, were there any anti-Jewish protests? And you said no. So the protest was not labeled as an anti-Jewish protest. I'm it not asking what it was an labeled. Anti-Israeli anti government I, the policy. The question wasn't what but it was labeled. But anti-Semitic incidents happen, or anti-Semitic things were said. So I just It is to an anti-Jewish protest. You agree with that? You change your testimony? Congresswoman. Anti-Jewish things were said at protests, yes. Thank you for changing your testimony. Another instance when you changed your testimony is you stated that Professor Massad was no longer chair. Then you stated he's under investigation. He is still chair on the website. So has he been terminated as chair? Congresswoman, I, I, I want to confirm the facts before getting back to you. I know I you confirmed confirm that he was un under investigation. Yes, I can did, confirm that. Did but you I, confirm he was still the chair? I need, I need to confirm that with you. I, I'm, well, let me I ask want, you this. Will you make check. the commitment to remove him as chair? Um, I think that would be, I think I, I would, yes. <laughs> Let me come back with yes, but I think I, I just want to confirm his current status before I write. We'll before take before that as a yes, to. that you will confirm that he will no longer be chair. Mr. Bean's time has expired. Um, Mr. Scott, you're recognized for five minutes. I'm, I'm sorry, you want to be last. Ms. Chavez de Raymer, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the witnesses for being here today. The widespread anti-Semitism we're seeing on college campuses is one of the most important issues in higher education. Since the horrific terror attacks of October 7th, Jewish students have found themselves constantly under attack for simply being Jewish. Dr. Shafiq, Columbia has been one of the worst offenders. I place that responsibility of campus safety right at the feet of university presidents, and in this case, it's you. Jewish students fear for their lives at your university. They have been harassed, threatened, and assaulted by fellow classmates. 
but it's no wonder students think this is okay. They're learning in class how to target Jews. At our hearing with the presidents of MIT, Harvard, and UPenn, I highlighted the astonishingly low number of courses being offered on Jewish history. Dr. Shafiq, I also looked into your university's course offerings for this semester. You only have three classes that teach the history of Israel. Two of them are taught by Israelis and Jews, but those two classes combined only have 30 seats. But the third class can have up to 60 students, and that class, of course, is taught by Joseph Massad, someone this committee is all too familiar with. Joseph Massad has been surrounded by controversy for his anti-Semitic rhetoric since the early 2000s. He praised the brutal attack, as we've heard today, of Hamas on October 7th as awesome, astonishing, and astounding. He called the videos that showed murder and rape of Israeli women stunning. Dr. Shavik, I've been to the towns attacked by Hamas. Let me tell you, there is nothing awesome or astounding about the rape and murder of thousands of innocent civilians. Dr. Shafiq, Joseph Massad has been a problem for more than 20 years. Why haven't you shown that anti-Semitism is not tolerated at your university by firing him? I know you've commented already on that today. Does Columbia support this type of speech? No, and as I said, he is under investigation. But I also, if I may, speak to your question about our course offerings. Before this hearing, uh, the two directors of our Institute for Israel and Jewish Studies came to see me. And they said to me, make sure the committee knows that Columbia is not a hotbed of anti-Semitism, but that we are a pioneer in Jewish studies. But we two classes is not going to uh, prolifically tell that to the world. And that's what yeah. the story that needs to be told. And let me excuse me. Dr. Massad is a tenured professor, but that doesn't mean he can't be fired, correct? Can There's, he be fired? There are, there are some very uh, complex issues around tenure. So at Columbia we University, quote, an appointment with tenure may be terminated for cause only when a faculty member is found to be professionally unfit, as demonstrated, for example, by gross inefficiency, habitual and intentional neglect of duty, other serious breaches of academic conduct, or serious personal misconduct. Dr. Shafiq, you told Congressman Wahlberg earlier today that if given the opportunity to grant Dr. Massad a tenured position today, you would not. In your opinion, has his anti-Semitic conduct risen to being professionally unfit or a serious breach of academic conduct or serious professional misconduct? As I said, he is being investigated. So he can be fired according to this quote. According to our rules, there are certain conditions under which tenured faculty Okay, moving can on. Be As I said back in December, the most powerful mover of campus culture is education itself. And you said that today. Mm -hmm. We can stop this if we educate the future about Israel. And again, those classes do not prove that you're taking action with what you said. But Columbia has shown through its choices on faculty and, of course, offerings that you don't care about anti-Semitism that you'll turn a blind eye to the attacks on the most persecuted people of the last 5,000 years. That's why you've let Joseph Massad teach at a class bigger than all the other Israeli history classes combined. That's why you continue to allow your Jewish students to be harassed, threatened, and assaulted on your campus. And Dr. Shafiq, you said earlier today that the best way to combat anti-Semitism is through that education. So I'm gonna say it once again. So since there are only three undergrad courses Columbia offers on Jewish and Israeli history, will you commit to pushing your deans to add more courses on Jewish history and remove those who teach and praise anti-Semitic violence like Joseph Massad? Our Institute for Israeli and Jewish Studies offers 21 courses. We have a collaborative arrangement with the Jewish Theological Seminary, and many of the students who are doing the joint degree with the Jewish Theological Seminary are here. It's so time your Jewish students finally extensive. see that you actually care about their safety. Teach these classes and fire the racists. It's a pretty low bar. We'll be watching to see if you do that, and Madam Chair, I'll yield back my t time. Thank you. Mr. Williams, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. You know, I'm really puzzled about how a university with such a prestigious reputation, such immense resources, and with such a storied history arrived at such a dissolute and depraved place. It's very stunning. Uh, just to address these questions to the board members, uh, in the last 20 years, uh, have there been Columbia professors or students who have been forced to retire or leave the university because of denouncements by fellow staff members or accusations by students, pressures from outside groups? I've been on the board. This is my sixth year on the board. 
Uh, but I don't recall actions of that nature happening. Ms. Shipman? Uh, yeah, I've been on the board 10 years, and, and neither do I. Professor Serban, uh, you don't recall his leaving, believes that the university was communist, his, uh, was his words. You don't recall that? Um, you know. Professor Schizer, you've been there some years. Um, are you aware, publicly or privately, that uh, any of your colleagues have left the university either because they believe their beliefs aren't welcome or because they feel like they have no upward mobility because of their beliefs? I'm not remembering a case like that, sir. So no, no one's come to you privately and said, hey, Columbia's not the place for me. This is, uh, this is hostile because of I'm a conservative or I'm Jewish or I hold any uh, beliefs that seem to be contrary to, uh, to the university. So look, I'm a, I'm a conservative at Columbia Law School. Uh, I was dean for 10 years. Place has been good to me. Uh, I, are, I there a lot, are there a lot of people like you? Or are you afraid but, to but speak I, out? But I do want to say that I am not the norm, and I'd love more conservatives. So um, how much investment, again to the board members, how much investment has Columbia received by foreign governments, uh, their donors, or significant don uh, donations from foreign individuals from countries like China, Qatar, Saudi Arabia? Uh, I know that the committee's asked for that information. Um, do you have that number for us today? I don't have that number at hand. Are, Are you aware of uh, significant donations from any of those locations to the university in your tenure in six years? I'm aware that we receive uh, funds from s at least some of those countries. Uh, which ones specifically? Um, I don't remember all the ones you mentioned. Um, if you mentioned, did you mention China? Sir? I did. Okay. China sends uh, many students to Columbia University, and my understanding is the state pays their tuition. President uh, Shafiq, um, are faculty and staff required to sign DEI statements to be employed or to continue their employment at Columbia? No. They're not required to provide DEI statements? Um, I, I'm pretty sure that's part of your employment uh, process, isn't that right? No, I think, I think some departments ask faculty to talk about what they bring that's different to that department or to that role. And that's an optional thing that they can add to, a, to an employment. It's optional, and if you refuse to, then it has no bearing on your hiring at the school? Is that really what you're saying? Frankly, I think it depends on the needs of that particular department. You know, if the math department or the biology department or the neuroscience department has issues around they're missing certain perspectives on their faculty they might pay more attention to it others might not i, I think it's very much dependent on so the dei the policy in columbia um, doesn't require statements from faculty administrators um, in order uh, as part of their hr process that's what you're saying we don't have a central dei office at columbia uh, we have schools and faculties who think about what are the different perspectives that they've got on their faculty, and then they make choices about what's missing in terms of perspectives, backgrounds, skills uh, that are needed for the faculty, and that they have people who are working on those issues at the school and departmental level. I, I think, I th personally, I think that you're in deep denial about uh, the culture at Columbia um, in terms of uh, the actual openness to um, views that differ from the culture of the school, uh, where your money comes from, uh, the disruption of uh, classes and uh, the DEI statements. I just want to uh, enter into the record, Madam Chairwoman, uh, a webpage from the US Holocaust Museum website that describes the Nazi takeover of German universities in the 1930s. And frankly, I see the parallels as striking. Um, it's entitled uh, German universities uh, in the Nazi regime, something like that. Um, and it really talks about that there were denouncements of professors for views that weren't consistent. Uh, it talks about the influence of outside groups, particularly money. Um, it's where statements of loyalty were required uh, in order to continue with the university and that uh, the teaching quality dropped significantly because uh, politics and adherence to politics triumphed over Thank you, Mr. Williams. To Without objection, 
what you're requesting will be placed in the record. Academic Mr. excellence, thank you. I yield. Mr. Marion, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, there are times in my district when constituents ask me frequently whether committee hearings have real tangible purpose and are effective in creating change. In answer to that question, I need only point to the series of committee hearings that the House Committee on Education and the Workforce has held over the past six months on anti-Semitism in higher education to resoundingly answer yes, these hearings do make a difference and do create change. I think it's clear today that this panel has learned at least some of the lessons from the magnificent failures of Harvard, MIT, and UPenn when they appeared here several months back. What is my question still remaining is whether or not it's just talk or whether or not real action will follow to change what has occurred on the campus of Columbia University. I had a whole series of questions prepared on a number of different circumstances and people and what they said and what, was, what the responses were, but my colleagues before me have actually covered most of that. So here's what I really want to talk about today, because I think that there's a foundational issue behind all of this. It's a foundation, foundational issue about truth. I think one of the reasons why it's been difficult for university presidents to sit before us and to actually answer questions affirmatively is because they fear declaring what they know to be truth. They're fearing the pushback. I happen to believe that there are absolute truths in this world. Truths that are objective and not subjective. Truths that should stand even when it is unpopular or when it is hard. I want to ask each one of you on the panel, do you agree with that statement? Dr. Shafi. Uh, Congressman Ryan, I can assure you I am not afraid of telling the truth and I am not afraid of doing things that might be unpopular. No, that wasn't my question. Do you so, believe that there are absolute truths in this world that are objectively true? Yes. Absolutely. Ms. Shipman? Yes, I agree. Good. Mr. Greenwald? Yes. Good. I think, I happen to think that one of these absolute truths is that each person in this world was created with equal and eternal value. Do you agree with that, Dr. Shafi? I do. I do. Definitely. Definitely. Certainly. Yes. These are what are called softball questions. And what I, what I can tell you is I'm afraid that actually some of the people that you employ and some of your colleagues at other institutions actually don't believe that. But the greater question is, are you going to enforce that? Are you going to apply those principles? Are you going to apply that truth? I want to, uh, I want to commend uh, Mr. Greenwald for some of the very direct answers that you've given today. Yes. Because quite honestly, we haven't heard direct answers. And from a few of you today, you've given some good answers today, some things that we need to hear. But we need to see action, not just hearing it here today, because there's a lot of students here today that needed your action in the last six months, and you haven't got given the action they need to push back against the untruth that is in this world that is prevalent on your campus. There is a major difference between knowledge of truth, understanding of the basis of that truth, and wisdom and courage in the application in that truth. And what we need is the wisdom and courage from you, Dr. Shafiq, to apply this, uh, the principles that you purport to stand for and to apply the truth that you just uh, evidenced here today and make sure that your actions follow your words today. Only time will tell whether your words here today are hollow or whether the actions are truly to follow. I yield to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Stefanik. Ms. Shipman, was there an effort to get other trustees to sign a letter supporting President Shafiq? No. There was not? No. Will you comply with all document requests related to email correspondence regarding any potential letter? We have Because I, board members have come forward anonymously to this committee raising the issue of a letter that was circulated that members of the boards did not sign on in support. Are you testifying today under oath? You have I'm, no knowledge of any draft letter in support of Dr. Shafiq. No knowledge whatsoever. And we're, I, my understanding is we're fully complying and ready to give you whatever you need. Mr. Greenwald, are you aware of any letter that was circulated? No, that's surprising to me. Professor David, are you aware? Not at all. My final question is, there's been a lot of discussion on Columbia's putting out a statement calling against calling for the genocide of Jews. That statement was put out after the catastrophically morally repugnant answers by your colleagues from MIT, Penn, and Harvard, correct? That was when you put out that statement after that hearing? Congresswoman, you, you shed a light on an important issue I'm just I asking when you put it out. It was after that it, hearing. It was definitely after it because it, 
and frankly, you are it aware that obvious. And you so are aware that Congress voted 377 to 44 condemning anti-Semitism. That is a strong bipartisan vote. Would you support that vote condemning anti-Semitism? Yes. And you are aware that in that bill that got 377 members out of 435 members of Congress condemns from the river to the sea as anti-Semitic. Yes, but, I am aware of that. But you don't believe from the river to the sea is anti-Semitic. We have already issued a statement to our community saying that language is hurtful and we don't we wouldn't we would prefer not to hear it on our campus. You'd prefer not to hear it or is there disciplinary action taken against students of those anti-Semitic statements? Thank you, Ms. Stefanik. I, I want an answer to that question. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah. Has there been disciplinary action taken against students who have chanted from the river to the sea, which you have testified is anti-Semitic and which Congress has voted that it is anti-Semitic? So we have, we, have, uh, we have some disciplinary cases ongoing around that language. We have specified that those kind of chants should be restricted in terms of where they happen. We need and you we to are wrap it at, up, Dr. Sorry. Shafi. And we are looking at it. We are looking at it. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the ranking members recognize for five minutes. Thank you, ma <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Shizer, um Professor Shizer, you've. Um, indicated the tension between protesting the war and anti-Semitism. Um, how do you prevent uh, gatherings from going from one to the other? I think, sir, that there are two things that we need to do. One is to be very clear, and the President has been, and the trustees have been, that free and open exchange is critical. And the second is to make very clear, and I believe we have, that discrimination, harassment, and hate are unacceptable. And it is entirely appropriate for people to take a view about the war in Gaza. People can oppose it, people can support it. What you can't do is Isn't be- you're trying to enforce student um, behavior on this. How would you, um, how would it be helpful if language in a bill that this committee reported on a party line vote uh, requiring a public, saying that a public institution may not prohibit a person, a person, not a student, a person, from freely engaging in non-commercial expressive activity in generally accessible areas on an institution's campus if the person's conduct is lawful. How would you um, be able to deal with that? Would that so be helpful in trying to keep anti-Semitism off campus. So I would need to study that language, sir, but I will say that having a place where speech is robust and permitted is very appropriate and necessary, and it but is, this in is fact, a whole camp. This is the whole campus. So um, I would not support uh, speech anywhere at any time. I think we need classes to take place. We don't want them disrupted, but we need protests and we need speech just to be in the right place. Ms. Shipman, you were asked a question about what it says about um, the situation when this is the fourth hearing we've had to have on anti-Semitism. Um, what does it say when there have been no hearings on racism, homophobia, Islamophobia, or how you could make campuses safe for transgender students? What's my, what, is, what is my thought about that? So don't you think we should have had some hearings on those not problems? Look, we, we have a specific problem right now on our campus, so I can speak from what I know, and that is rampant anti-Semitism. Um, and that's, this hearing is uh, hard and helpful for us at this moment. I certainly think, because I've heard from a lot of students on our campus in my time on the board, we would benefit from broader hearings about hate in general. And as I've said, I think we have a, a broader societal problem that's, that's reflected uh, in a really divisive way on college but, campuses. But anti-Semitism is the only one we ought to be addressing, not racism, homophobia. 
That's, I'm not, we certainly address all of do, it do on, we have no tolerance for any of that on our campus, but right now. Islamophobia. How I've trans spent, students, I, I and we've had, here, we've had here, during these hearings, we've had some um, members disparage trans students in the middle of the hearing on anti-Semitism. Shouldn't we be having hearings making sure all students can be safe? I understand that sentiment, Congressman, and I have spent a significant amount of time with some of our Muslim students from the region, and their stories are also heartbreaking. And I don't like that any student on our campus does not feel safe, but I think what we see most routinely right now is political speech crossing the line into anti-Semitism, and, and, and we have and, got to figure so, that out. And so we don't address the fact that black students may not feel safe gay students, Muslim students. Let me ask another question, uh, Ms. Shafiq. If someone says something that's um, anti-Semitic, what, what should the sanction be? It, it depends what they say, who they say it to, what context it's in, but in any situation, we would pursue disciplinary action. Should they always, and that should isn't they always just be expelled? No, I mean, I think, you know, expulsion is a very uh, extreme uh, act, but we, you know, we are an educational institution, so we've got to start by educating our students to not say certain things and change the culture so that nobody is discriminated or harassed at all. Uh, that should be our objective. Thank you. So you would try to fit the sanction with the seriousness of the crime, absolutely. the context, and hopefully use it as an educational opportunity. Agree. Thank you. Thank you. You back. Okay. Yeah. I now um, recognize the Ranking member for closing statement. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. First, let's ask unanimous consent to enter the record uh, the article Columbia's Own Middle East War from January 19, 2005, that provides additional nuance on the issue of professors at Columbia. And also, unanimous consent to enter into the record a report from the University of Chicago's Project on Security and Threats analyzing the fear both Jewish and Muslim students feel on campus and how that fear often results from miscommunication. And another um, enter into the record, uh, a letter from Ted Mitchell, president of the American Co Council on Education, to Chairwoman Fox and ranking member and, and myself, outlining the concerns um, he and the organization have um, with uh, HR 7683, the bill that I referenced, including the following quote, given the committee's recent focus on concerns regarding anti-Semitism and the need for campuses to increase their efforts to provide safe environments from, free from discrimination for all students, we are puzzled by the bill's inclusion of a provision that would tie the hands of campus administrators <coughs> to address these issues and potentially make campuses less safe. Without objection. Madam Chair, we all agree that Jewish students should be entitled to a safe learning experience at all colleges. In fact, all students ought to be entitled to the same. This is the fourth hearing we've had on anti-Semitism, none on racism, homophobia, Islamophobia, transgender. In fact, um, the Office of Civil Rights uh, budget has been cut by the Republican budget. <coughs> <laughs> Excuse me. And we've reported a bill that would actually create more problems. I think the Office of Civil Rights has indicated that they get a lot more complaints from racism, homophobia, Islamophobia, and trans students. Um, and those need to also be addressed. And I hope the committee would somehow promote the safety of all students, not just one group. And I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Scott. We're deeply disturbed by what we're seeing at Columbia and by many of the things we've heard in today's hearing. It's important to set the record straight on a few things. 
President Shafiq testified there have been 15 suspensions related to anti-Semitic incidents. That's misleading. In fact, between October 7 and March 23, after months of anti-Semitic incidents, only three students were given interim suspensions for anti-Semitic conduct. All three were lifted or dropped to probation, including a student who repeatedly harassed students, screaming, F the Jews. Of the 10 suspensions that came in response to the Resistance 101, five were lifted because Columbia determined they were not involved. The only two Columbia students who remained suspended for incidents related to October 7 that took place before we called Dr. Shufik to testify are the two Jewish students suspended for spraying the odorous substance Representative Omar referred to. Dr. Shufik's testimony was misleading there too. Documents Columbia produced to the committee show that the substance sprayed was a non-toxic gag spray. While that was an inappropriate action, for months Jewish students have been vilified with false accusations of a, quote, chemical attack, end quote, and Columbia failed to correct the record. And radical anti-Semitic faculty remain a huge problem throughout Columbia. At the Middle Eastern Studies Department, School of Social Work, School of Public Health, Law School, and many others. And multiple Columbia departments have been placed into receivership in the past 20 years. If Columbia takes this seriously, it's a remedy worth pursuing. While some changes have begun on campus, there is still a significant amount of work to be done, as we've heard today. We will be looking for answers to the questions that have been raised today in a very timely fashion and we are prepared to bring you back if we don't see more tangible progress. I thank our witnesses again for being here today. I thank all the members who have attended to help us uh, gather the information we've gathered. Without objection, there being no further business, the committee stands adjourned. <laughs>